Yippee ki yay, podcast listeners. It's season finale time here at Pick Six Movies. What is Pick Six Movies? Just the fly in the ointment, Hans. The monkey in the wrench. Oh, and it's also a podcast where we talk about movies, six of them per season, all selected based on a central theme. This here is season 18. Christmas time is here. Sure, it's past Christmas, but that's all time and that's a flat circle, so shut up. We're not actually looking at Christmas movies, we're looking at Christmas adjacent movies. Like this one, Die Hard 2. And here to help me mock the movie is my oldest and best pal, Chad Cooper, who will also whip a little knowledge on you in the upfront. And then I'll be back to do lame impressions and generally goof on a movie made by our betters. So get out the popcorn and buckle into that ejection seat for a wild and woolly season finale. It's Die Hard 2 on Pick 6 Movies! There are two types of people in the world. Those people that say Die Hard is their favorite Christmas movie, and those people who roll their eyes when they hear people say that Die Hard is their favorite Christmas movie. Let's go ahead and set the record straight before we go any further. Die Hard is a movie that takes place at Christmas, but it is not a Christmas movie by the definition that a Christmas movie is a movie where the removal of Christmas would fundamentally prevent the narrative of the film from taking place or alter key events in the film. Die Hard could take place at any time. There might be some holiday jokes to get removed here and there, but overall, Die Hard does not explicitly rely on Christmas as a fundamental detail of the character development or plot of the movie. Uh, I know, there are people out there who disagree with this point of view, and those people that disagree are the type of people that say, Pete Best is my favorite Beatle. Sure, you can say these types of things, and they are technically true, but please realize that you sound like an asshole. What I won't argue with you is that the quality of the film Die Hard is fantastic. It is arguably one of the best action movies ever made, thanks in part to the movie's direction, cinematography, and performance of the film's lead that embodies characteristics that were very different from the one-man army action heroes that became synonymous with 80s era action movies. And that famous character's name, you know it, Joe Leland. Well, it was originally Joe Leland, but then it became John McClane. But I'm getting ahead of the story behind the 80s era action movie classic. And to tell that story, we gotta head back to the 1960s. In 1966, Roderick Thorpe published the novel The Detective. Thorpe worked at a detective agency that his father owned. How cool is that? He graduated college and pursued his passion of creative writing. He later taught at universities in New Jersey and California, and his passion for writing led to freelance articles in newspapers and magazines, which was the practice of many writers at the time. The publication of the novel, The Detective, was a hard-hitting look at police life. And the book was very well received, and two years after it was published, it was turned into a feature film starring Frank Sinatra as Detective Joe Leland. The movie was incredibly successful, becoming the top-grossing movie of 1968, and was viewed by many as the best performance Sinatra gave in his career. The film adaptation of the novel, The Detective, was a classic film noir movie, but it was also a move towards more adult depictions of what it was like to work as a police officer in the real world. And the movie was also one of the first major Hollywood movies that explicitly dealt with the subject of homosexuality. Sinatra's portrayal of Detective Joe Leland was grounded and earnest, and he was a man dealing with marital issues as he discovers this open and shut case is a little more complicated than you could ever even begin to imagine. For novelist Roderick Thorpe, this success was a huge career boost. His book was a huge hit. There was a movie based on the book that was a massive success. And with all the success swirling around, what do you do? You write a sequel. So in 1975, Thorpe published the novel Nothing Lasts Forever as a follow-up to the 1966 novel The Detective. Thorpe said he went to see the movie The Towering Inferno, which was one of those super star-packed ensemble cast disaster movies from the 70s about a skyscraper that catches on fire. Thorpe goes to see this movie. He goes to sleep that night and has a dream about a man being chased around a high-rise. He wakes up and says, hey, I got my idea for the sequel to The Detective. So here's what happens in the book Nothing Lasts Forever. NYPD detective Joe Leland 
returns, of course, as he's visiting a 40-story office headquarter, the Klaxon Oil Corporation in Los Angeles on Christmas Eve, where his daughter, Stephanie Leland Gerano, works. Leland is waiting for his daughter's Christmas party to end, the way a good dad does, and wouldn't you know it, a group of terrorists take over the skyscraper, led by the brutal Anton, little Tony the Red, Gruber. Joe Leland gets wind of all this, and he knows that Gruber is a bad dude because of a counter-terrorism conference he went to a few years ago. Joe Leland ends up barefoot in the office complex and works with a young 22-year-old new LAPD recruit who's on the outside. This young cop's name, Al Pal. And only with his trusty police-issued revolver, Joe Leland fights the terrorists to save the hostages that includes his daughter and his grandchildren. Whoa, he's a grandpa? All right. It should be noted that the terrorists, as led by Little Tony the Red Gruber, are there to expose the Klaxon Oil Company for being in cahoots with Chile's dictatorial military government, exposing the shenanigans between this oil company and these Chilean no goodnicks, which leads to the execution of the oil company CEO and the terrorist plan to dump six million bucks in cash out the window of the high rise down to the streets below in protest. Merry Christmas, citizens of Los Angeles. Detective Joe Leland kills 11 terrorists. Look at you, Joe Leland, killing people. And in the climax of the book, Detective Joe Leland shoots and kills little Tony the Red Gruber. But his daughter also falls to her death during this standoff. Detective Joe Leland blames the oil company for the terrorist attack happening in the first place. And he goes to the top of the high rise and he dumps the six million bucks out the window as a big middle finger to big oil and to ease the pain of his now dead daughter. Detective Joe Leland leaves the building, remember it's Christmas Eve, and he comes across a female terrorist who's still alive, he shoots her in the head. Then this terrorist named Carl, who you thought was dead, but he's not, he pops up and wouldn't you know it, LAPD's finest 22 year old new recruit Al Pal shoots and kills him. Our story comes to an end with Detective Joe Leland bitter and broken more than he was when he showed up a few hours ago. His daughter is dead and he's killed a good baker's dozens worth of terrorists. Sounds like a pretty good book, doesn't it? I mean, a review of the book in the Los Angeles Times said, Nothing Lasts Forever was a ferocious, bloody raging book. So single-mindedly brilliant in concept and execution, it should be read in a single sitting. This was back when people read books. Roger Thorpe wrote a novel that was a solid piece of fiction that was tailor-made for a big screen adaptation. And Thorpe wanted Frank Sinatra to return to play the iconic character, Joe Leland. But Sinatra turned down the offer. Why did he turn down the opportunity to reprise his role as Joe Leland? Well, maybe old Blue Eyes didn't see himself crawling around in air ducts or leaping off of a high-rise building with a fire hose wrapped around his waist. Both sequences from the novel. Also, Frank Sinatra was 75 years old when he was offered this role in the movie. Oh my God, 75. With Sinatra out as the lead character, producers started looking for another actor to play the lead in the big screen adaptation of Nothing Lasts Forever. At one point, Clint Eastwood was attached to the project and he was gonna star in an adaptation in the early 80s. Now that's an old man I can see crawling around air ducts and leaping off buildings with a fire hose strapped to his waist. Regretfully, that movie was never made. Screenwriters Jeb Stewart and Steven D'Souza were tasked with adapting Nothing Lasts Forever to the big screen. D'Souza was fresh off his success with Nick Nolte and Eddie Murphy in the buddy cop blockbuster 48 Hours, and he also wrote the action-packed extravaganza Commando, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. Because of D'Souza's connection to Commando, there were rumors that the book might be reworked as a sequel to Commando, but D'Souza later confirmed that this was never the case. The screenwriters, Stewart and D'Souza, finished their adaptation of Nothing Lasts Forever, where the movie was retitled to, of course, Die Hard. And it was written to have no real direct connection to the novel and was in no way a sequel to the Frank Sinatra movie, The Detective. Although the movie is not a direct adaptation of the novel, a lot of key moments in the movie are 100% taken from the book, as is a lot of dialogue. The bare feet, the crawling through the air ducts, the leaping off the building with the fire hose trick, the finale with the gun strapped to the hero's back, all directly lifted from the book. The name of the lead character was obviously changed from Joe Leland to John McClane. They also made him not a grandpa and rolled back the clock on his age by a good 25 years. 
Our hero's daughter became an estranged wife. The American Klaxon Oil Corporation became the Japanese Nakatomi Corporation. The terrorists in the film were turned into thieves stealing $640 million in negotiable bear bonds. And they were not there to give the finger to the fossil fuel industries. Don't want to piss those guys off in the 80s. You don't want those gas lines like you saw in the 70s, do you? But all of these changes in editing are not uncommon when screenwriters adapt a novel into a screenplay. Heck, in Winston Groom's novel Forrest Gump, the title character goes into outer space with a male orangutan named Sue who goes weightless and orangutan piss flies around the capsule and hits another astronaut in the face. Not everything in the book has to go into the movie, although I would have enjoyed seeing Tom Hanks dodge floating blobs of monkey piss. But back to our movie intro. So movie producers had their script for Die Hard and they needed a real deal action star to make this movie a hit. D'Souza's work on Commando certainly introduced Arnold Schwarzenegger's name and put him at the top of the list to possibly star in Die Hard. Sylvester Stallone's role as John Rambo, Harrison Ford's time as Han Solo and Indiana Jones certainly got his name on the list. Charles Bronson's time in the Death Wish series, Robert De Niro, Nick Nolte, Mel Gibson, Richard Gere, Don Johnson, Burt Reynolds, they were all considered, but none of them were really interested or they just weren't the best fit to play John McClane. Enter Bruce Willis. Willis wasn't obviously the first choice to play John McClane because at the time he was known as a comedic actor and not an action hero. Keep in mind that action heroes in the 80s were piles of muscles or people that knew martial arts. They were big and bad and men to be feared. At this time, Bruce Willis was anything but a stereotypical action hero type. In 1985, Bruce Willis was starring in the American broadcast company comedy drama TV series Moonlighting alongside Sybil Shepard. This role showcased Willis's charming, lovable ability to play the comedic lead as Detective David Addison. So how did Bruce Willis land what is arguably his most iconic role? Die Hard director John McTiernan cast Willis as the lead, despite pushback from the studio, who felt that the choice doomed the film to failure. But McTiernan, who was fresh off directing Arnold Schwarzenegger in Predator, was riding high on that movie's success, so he had a little bit of pull. McTiernan felt that Bruce Willis's lack of bulging weight room, exploding muscles, and rippling veiny physique was exactly what was needed to make John McClane a character with which audiences could sympathize. And McTiernan was right. Bruce Willis's performance as John McClane came across as a regular hardworking cop who unexpectedly finds himself in dangerous circumstances. John McClane was grounded in reality when compared to the action heroes of the 80s. And the success of the movie, anchored by Bruce Willis's performance, solidified him as an action movie icon. Bonnie Bedelia was cast to play Holly McClane, John McClane's wife, Sergeant Al Powell was played by Reginald Vell Johnson, a role that he somewhat reprised when he had Headed up the ABC sitcom Family Matters, where he was quickly upstaged by Jaleel White as the character Steve Urkel. Professional asshole character actor William Atherton was cast to play an asshole, fresh off his performance as asshole Walter Peck in Ghostbusters and as asshole Jerry Hathaway in Real Genius. The movie's bad guy, Hans Gruber, was played by now legendary Alan Rickman. But at the time of Die Hard's release, Alan Rickman wasn't well known by American audiences at all. He'd yet to appear in The January Man, Quigley Down Under, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, Galaxy Quest, Love Actually, and every single Harry Potter movie. Filming of the movie began in November of 1987 and it wrapped up in March of 88 with a budget of around 35 million bucks. The movie was filmed at the Fox Plaza in Century City, and at the time, the location was mostly unoccupied and under construction. The movie cinematographer was Jean Devon, whose work on Die Hard led to him directing Speed and that movie's sequel, Speed 2. He directed Twister and that second Lara Croft movie starring Angelina Jolie. Devon said the building design of the Fox Plaza, aka the Nakatomi Tower, was so unique that it was almost a character in and of itself within the movie. For the first day of shooting, Bruce Willis went from the set of Moonlighting to the set of Die Hard, where he filmed one of the movie's most iconic scenes where John McClane jumps off the top of a building with a fire hose strapped around his waist. That is a hell of a first day at work. Bruce Willis said that his role as John McClane in Die Hard was really challenging because the majority of the movie had him acting alone. 
His performance didn't give him the opportunity to interact with much of the other cast, which left him a lot of time to spend with his new girlfriend, Demi Moore. Die Hard hit the big screen on July 22nd, 1988, and it came in third at the box office behind Coming to America and Who Framed Roger Rabbit. But the next week, it came in fourth behind Cocktail, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and Coming to America. Then it bounced back between third and fourth place for weeks, and then it fell out of the top 10 grossing movies in early October. Pretty good run. Although the movie never crept above the number three spot in box office grosses, Die Hard was well received by critics and audiences. The movie's long run time in US theaters and strong performance overseas ultimately earned the movie an estimated $140 million against that budget of 35 million. When Die Hard hit the home video market, it bolstered the movie's already successful run in theaters, and Die Hard essentially created a subgenre of action films where the movie featured just a regular person who was vulnerable and with whom the audience could identify. There were no snappy one-liners filled with goofy puns as a reaction to perilous situation. John McClane became the prototype for an action hero who overcomes through ingenuity and suffering. The success of Die Hard led to a string of copycat movies, including, but not limited to, Die Hard in a Hockey Stadium, Sudden Death, Die Hard in a Prison, The Rock, Die Hard at a Boarding School, Toy Soldiers, Die Hard on a Mountain, Cliffhanger, Die Hard on a Battleship, Under Siege, Die Hard on a Train, Under Siege 2, Die Hard on a Bus, Speed, Die Hard on a Cruise Ship, Speed 2, Die Hard on a Plane, Passenger 57, Die Hard on a Different Plane, Executive Decision, Die Hard on a Different Plane with Prisoners, Con Air, Die Hard on a Different Plane with the President of the United States, Air Force One, Die Hard at the White House, White House Down, Die Hard in the White House, but with a different president. Olympus has fallen. And finally, Die Hard at an airport. Die Hard 2. Die Harder. With the success of Die Hard and everybody getting in on the Die Hard formula, it made sense that John McClane would return for another silver screen adventure. Stephen D'Souza returned to write the screenplay. Doug Richardson stepped in as his writing partner. And the script for Die Hard 2 was adapted from a novel as well, titled 58 Minutes, written by Walter Wagner. Wagner published the novel in 1987, and it's centered on a protagonist who has to take out a group of terrorists in an airport before the plane his wife is on crashes. How exciting. D'Souza and Richardson reworded the story, plugged in John McClane and his wife Holly McClane, and they brought back just about every character from the first Die Hard that they could shoehorn into the script. John McTiernan did not return to direct the sequel. Instead, he opted to helm the film adaptation of the Tom Clancy novel, The Hunt for Red October. Remember when they used to base movies on books? That was a good time. And John McTiernan's directorial influence is clearly absent in the movie sequel. Taking over in the director's chair was Rennie Harlan, a man who was fresh off A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master. Rennie Harlan would go on to direct The Adventures of Fort Fairlane, Cutthroat Island, and Deep Blue Sea. And perhaps he was the perfect choice to make a movie that would be bigger, louder, more violent, more explosive, more profane, and more expensive than the first Die Hard. Die Hard 2 reportedly had a budget almost double that of the first film at $70 million. Joel Silver worked as a producer on the movie, as he did the original, which reportedly created its own unique set of challenges. And under his guidance, he helped to deliver a movie that tonally was very different than the original. Die Hard 2 takes place on Christmas Eve, two years after the Nakatomi Tower incident of the first film. John McClane is in the airport waiting for his wife's plane to land when terrorists take over the airport. This time around, the German bad guys were replaced with a bunch of Americans who are meddling in Central American affairs a la Iran-Contra. And the plot of Die Hard 2 mirrors the original Die Hard in just about every way, from the crawling through the air vents to signature catchphrases to a notably increased body count, as the original Die Hard had 23 people killed, whereas Die Hard 2 boasts a total of 271 deaths including 235 that die in a single plane crash. Die Hard 2 hit theaters on July 2nd, 1990, and did something that the first movie could not do, which is top the box office as the highest grossing movie when released. And it ended up making over $240 million worldwide, despite lukewarm reviews by critics. 
And the rest, as they say, is history. Die Hard 2 begat Die Hard with a Vengeance in 1995, co-starring Sam Jackson. Twelve years later, there was Live Free or Die Hard. Six years after that, A Good Day to Die Hard. And there's a rumored prequel in the works called McLean that nobody asked for, where audiences would get to see John McClane back in the 70s, solving crimes in dirty old New York City, I'm guessing with a bunch of pimps and hoes. The original Die Hard is truly something special. It's fun, it's engaging, it's well executed. It is an iconic action movie that weaves Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, Singing in the Rain and Let It Snow into the movie's soundtrack. It's funny and charming and brutal and smart and just a hell of a good time. For the first time, audiences were rooting for an action hero who was just a regular Joe who got hurt and had a good heart. Then they made a string of sequels. They got rid of all that and they did all the stuff that Die Hard knockoffs did, which resulted in movies that were pale imitations of the original Die Hard. And none of these movies ripped off Die Hard in all the wrong ways more than Die Hard 2. In an interview, Bruce Willis was asked if he thought Die Hard and Die Hard 2 were Christmas movies, and he said no, because they're not Christmas movies. They're movies set at Christmas. Are Die Hard and Die Hard 2 good movies? Die Hard's an excellent movie, but Die Hard 2? Well, there's only one way to settle this once for all. Let's get my partner in crime in here to break down this movie scene by scene to see if it's any good as we wrap up this season's theme, Christmas time is here. So ladies and gentlemen, put your tray tables and seats in the upright position and make sure your seat belts are securely fastened as we land this season's finale, Die Hard 2, Die Harder. And welcome to Pick 6 Movies. I'm Chad Cooper, and I am joined by the man who can yippee ki any motherfucker better than anybody I know, Mr. Bo Ransdell. Bo, how are you doing this evening? How we end up doing the same show, the same guy, the, uh, whatever Bruce Willis says in this movie. Hey, <laughs> it's uh, we're doing a Bruce Willis movie. That was only a matter of time. <laughs> I'm surprised it took this long, really, because he's made more stinkers than he's made quality motion pictures. Oh, for sure. And he has, like, they drop about, like, one a month these days, where he's just showing up for some paycheck on some garbage movie or another. Yeah, we have a season floating around somewhere that's nothing but six Bruce Willis movies, and it's just a matter of time until we get to that, but we'll save that for another day. I kicked off the introduction of this movie talking about how there is a segment of individuals who claim that Die Hard is their favorite Christmas movie and saying that Die Hard is your favorite Christmas movie is just a way for people to set themselves apart from the rest of us normal people like those jackasses who ride recumbent bicycles or people that have iguanas as pets it's fine if you do that but don't be shocked when the majority of people view your life choices as unorthodox because that's what your end goal is to be different and stand apart from other normal people yeah it's like calling yourself a safe Satanist versus an atheist, which now that I say that out loud is probably cooler. <laughs> And if Die Hard is your favorite Christmas movie of all time, why isn't Die Hard 2 your second favorite Christmas movie? Nobody ever talks about Die Hard 2 as a candidate for best Christmas movie. Mostly because it's not very good. Yeah, because it's terrible. <laughs> it's a bad, bad movie that reminds you of a good movie, but is in itself not a good film. No, it's very formulaic. It does everything that the first one did, but in a completely different way. Which is the recipe for a good action movie sequel? Please see Lethal Weapon 2 as an example of how to pull that off exquisitely well. This is more of a Home Alone 2 type of copy and paste when it comes to bad movie sequels. And speaking of Lethal Weapon 2, this movie really wants to be Lethal Weapon 2 in so many ways. I wish it started as exciting as Lethal Weapon 2 did. At the beginning of this movie, you get the big block letters that crash into the screen, Die Hard, clank, clank, 2, clank. But instead of a high-speed car, 
car chase featuring known anti-Semite Mel Gibson and a man who's getting too old for this shit, Danny Glover, we just see a car being towed in the snow outside LaGuardia Airport in Washington, D.C. Which is the exact opposite of a car chase, <laughs> is a car being towed because it's been parked illegally. And it's one of those, you would presume a New York cop, even though he's a Washington cop, but he looks like a guy who would be eating a donut at any given time. Uh -huh. He's writing out a ticket, and of course, Bruce Willis, in his trademark Christmas gray sweater, is running up. He's like, hey, come on, pal. I'm a cop. How about a little professional courtesy? Hey, thin blue line, you know? Blue lives matter. Cop and a half. Stop or my mom will shoot. I was a cop in New York. I moved to L.A. because my wife took a job. Did you see the first Die Hard? If so, hopefully all this rings a bell to you because we're in Washington, D.C. Great little democracy. This is a prime example of why this is an inferior movie. And it's because of this exposition dump that he gives a cop writing him a ticket. <laughs> hey, I didn't want to move out to L.A., but that's where your career was, man. <laughs> you're like, who gives a fuck? You're, you're getting a ticket. You're like, where that argument begins and ends is, hey, I'm a cop, too. <laughs> oh, that doesn't matter? I guess I shut the fuck up then. This traffic cop, he says, fuck you merry christmas and then they tow john mcclain's car and then his beeper goes off because we're in the early 90s do you ever have a beeper Bo? no 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 i never did i i went straight to a flip phone oh yeah he he's got one of those like oh my god i guess i gotta score some grass for those kids <laughs> my beep is going off i'm outside an airport we cut to inside the airport which looks like the sunday after thanksgiving and not christmas eve when our movie takes place there are people everywhere it is madness which is the first piece of evidence that I present to the court around the implausibility of all the bullshit in this movie taking place on Christmas Eve. There is no way all of the lunacy that happens in this film would ever happen on December 24th after 3 p.m. Does this happen on Christmas yes! Eve? Yes! The only, the only reference I remember in the movie is Fred Thompson saying it's Christmas week. No, they, it is Christmas Eve. I looked that up on something and something said it was, so it is. Fair enough. Like, I've never been in an airport uh, on Christmas Eve because I have a, a family and I'm loved. Right, because it's, it's a sad, lonely place. You go there first and you're like, well, this isn't depressing enough. Is there a Greyhound station nearby? <laughs> if, if not, is there just a, somewhere I could thumb a ride <laughs> on a lonely highway with no street lamps on Christmas Eve? The only way this movie is more implausible is if they were going to hold the Super Bowl, Daytona 500, election of a new pope, and the Star Star studded premiere of an animated remake of the godfather all at the same time while this movie happens there's so much stupid shit that they try to pack into this movie that could never happen but we'll get to all that so as he's rushing through this throng of people in this airport uh -huh. he goes to an information desk to ask a woman hey where are the pay phones <laughs> And she points to some random direction to get this guy out of there. And this gives us yet another piece of clunky exposition where we focus on a news report that she's watching where a reporter is like, hey, there's this guy named Esperanza. Notable South American bad guy and one assumes cocaine smuggler Ramiro Rodrigo Diego Santiago Eduardo Esperanza is being immediately extradited to the United States from the completely legitimate country of El Santa Nitistiestas on Christmas Coming up next in sports, Channel 8 Sports Authority, Chuck Porterhouse has an update on the unseasonably cold night for Game 7 of the World Series between the Chicago Cubs and the Chicago White Sox in the first ever Sausage Series. Back to you, Dan. We use this report as a transition to go to a hotel room uh -huh. where a very naked William Sadler is doing <laughs> Tai Chi in front of this news report, which culminates in him just aiming a gun at the screen. First off, welcome back, William Sadler. We have have not seen you since tales from the crypt bordello of blood where i think he played a mummy that's right he was he was the star of demon knight and cameoed in the sequel yes and he played the grim reaper in at least two of those bill and ted movies because i never saw the mm -hmm. third one but he's a wonderful character actor but i just want to say tip of the hat to william sadler's body in this he is a sculpted adonis naked in this motel six or best western wherever the hell he is with his ass and his back 
back and his balls all hanging out yeah it's stunning like it's one of those things when you see it you're like fuck i really have made some poor choices with my life because my body has never even come close to resembling this da vinci-esque like rodan like sculpture of a human being holy god i looked at the way he was standing with his knees bent and his arms out and i was like i don't think i could even do that right now unless i was on a chair oh no no yeah i would have to have like a a, a high stool to to lean back on a spotter <laughs> a spot. somebody just be like whoa, whoa, whoa he's he's listing to the left somebody get underneath there we cut away from the the adonis that is william sadler naked to bruce willis in the airport for a scene that means nothing it's just him wandering around still looking for a goddamn phone and then we cut back to william sadler it's just to show that there's passage of time that's the whole point of it back at the hotel naked colonel bad guy or tai chi expert he's leading this team of military mercenaries and they all like march out of their rooms down the hallway of <laughs> like la quinta i really like that they all come out of their rooms in, like synchronized da, 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 yeah i wonder if they were like all right we're gonna do this one more time i swear to god jeff <laughs> you come out of that room five seconds early again this whole espionage thing is on. all right all right i know, I know. so when you hear my door close not open close count to three then open my door i got it i got it you say that but you haven't had it jeff and you're ruining everything my beeper went off i my wife's pregnant i swear to god i hope bruce willis kills you tonight <laughs> among the screw that comes marching out there's a black guy there's like some young guy robert patrick is there aka t1000 or mr c from lost after dark the throwback horror classic damn right written by pick six movies on mr bo ransdell available on digital download right now buy your copy today absolutely buy don't rent john mcclain he finally gets his meaty paws on a disease covered pup public phone receiver can you remember when we used to do that and he calls back his pager number and it goes to his wife bonnie bedelia who is on a flight above washington dc and john mcclain says hey pal this is john mcclain calling back someone important bonnie bedelia says this is your wife and yes i'm important hey pal did you land are you calling me well you're on a plane and you're on a phone it's fucking crazy it does take him a minute to wrap his head around this oh i've progress for me peaked at frozen pizza man no it's the 90s you idiot we have microchips and microwaves and faxes and air phones look did you shoot anybody yet no good look try not to murder countless people before my plane hits the ground it's gonna be half an hour landing and hopefully you didn't get my mom's car that she let you borrow towed earlier in the movie hopefully that didn't happen look i'd never do that by the way how about we ditch our lousy kids and go right to a motel and get down to some fucking <laughs> and she's like uh i all right, I guess. I don't really care for our family that much, so I'll just spend Christmas Eve with you. <laughs> Toodles, click. Yeah. So there's this old lady sitting beside Bonnie Bedelia on the plane, and this old woman says, isn't technology wonderful? You know, I used to carry mace, but now I carry this taser. It's like the one Catwoman used to barbecue that clown's nutsack in Batman Returns. If a rapist ever tried to stick his hot dog in my donut, I'm gonna blast him with a thousand volts of fuck off. I tried this taser on my little dog poor thing limp for a week pissed himself all over the place that's a move dennis hopper would approve of <laughs> you you ought to try this out on a dog or something first real oc and stigs maneuver <laughs> this old woman who's a monster she's reading a magazine with a full page ad for lethal weapon 2 starring danny glover who is too old for this shit and the aforementioned publicly vocal anti-semite mel gibson and again pick six movie rule number one don't remind us of a better movie while i'm watching your shitty movie rule number one two and three as far as i'm <laughs> concerned once we get done with this old woman on the airplane bruce willis literally runs into naked colonel bad guy he shoulder checks him like a total stranger it's a real like kafunk like you want to fucking start something bruce willis is like hey don't i recognize you pal and naked colonel bad guy is like yes you recognize me we have both been on television i have to go about my nefarious business now see you later hey pal look i was on tv a lot too a couple years ago at christmas nakatomi towers i killed like a hundred people and terrorists took over maybe you heard of me colonel naked bad guy he's like sir yes sir we will see you later i'm sure and he just kind of walks off and they give each other the stink eye in that scene and then we get the parallel of the scene from the original 
original movie where like all the vans pull into the nakatomi plaza except in this case a van pulls up to a church in the middle of nowhere uh-huh. where this old codger is i guess the groundskeeper of this abandoned church where he's watching a black and white television and eating old man soup that's what lonely old people do on christmas eve bo apparently so and these fake utility workers bang on the door and they kind of talk themselves inside by saying like hey we gotta check the equipment in here and he's like what well i guess all right come on in you want some presents i I bought some i don't have any family or children but if you'd like a watch that i used to wear that worked back in the 80s you can have that that's in the blue package (laughs) then the guy's like just talking his ear of just being an old man he's like yeah this old church he tell you it's gonna be a shame when they knock it down i feel like part of me is gonna die right alongside this church one of the bad guys who's listening to this old man yammer on and on is the guy who played meat from all three porkies movies and i'm shocked we haven't done a porkies movie that first movie speaking of mel gibson it's full of all kinds of anti-semitism and racist assholes in florida i've never seen any of the porkies movies the sequel has a scene where a girl pretends to be a prostitute and she goes out with a politician and then from out of her fake breast she pops a bottle that squirts puke all over the place at a fancy dinner party that sounds pretty good it is pretty good the first one was directed by bob clark who did a christmas story and black christmas Mm -hmm. two of the best christmas movies ever from totally different directions Yeah, he also did some of those baby geniuses movies pendulum swings bo hey he was old what are you gonna do when the old man's watching tv in the church before his impending death in just about 30 seconds we do see a tv report that says esperanza is coming from central america and he's a drug lord and it's christmas eve and uh apparently the world cup is taking place this night so they're really reinforcing that this guy esperanza he's bad dude bo and he's on his way to washington dc in a snowstorm this guy who looks a lot like john ham to me ends up shooting the old man codger oh you got me he falls down dead and so they radio i assume colonel naked bad guy to say the clubhouse is now secure actually bo he says this is buckwheat the clubhouse is secure or open that i like that they base their code names on how roaches little rascals alfalfa <laughs> this is darla have you seen Petey? come in Petey. this is froggy over oh my god froggy you need to lay off the smokes man <laughs> all right then we go to intrepid reporter sam coleman yeah who is giving yet another report about esperanza i'm like i fucking get it already this is intrepid news reporter samantha coleman at the airport covering the breaking story of cocaine cartel kingpin slash dictator esperanza coming here on christmas eve reporting live back to you chuck porterhouse and so then we get a throng of terrorists in a, a a meeting not unlike the one that happened on the beach in Invasion USA. <laughs> yeah. Where it's just a group of terrorists, one of whom looks a lot like Christopher Guest to me. Uh huh. Joining his pals, and he's like, So everything is in position, and a big storm is blowing in. God loves the core. And they all sink their watches in the most suspicious way possible. And one of them's like pulling out an earpiece and sliding a mysterious package, again, not unlike Invasion USA, under the table to another dude. Meanwhile, Bruce Willis is just sitting at the bar chain smoking oh man a how much i wish i could get away with smoking still and two remember the days when you could smoke in an airport holy crap that's when america w- was really something chad when john mcclain is watching these two goons in the airport lounge they're not doing anything suspicious at all even using his hypersensitive super cop detective whatever he's got I- i've watched this movie twice <laughs> recently there's nothing that they're doing that would lead one to believe they're up to no good it's not like in beverly hills cop when the dudes in the strip club with the bulge in his jacket in the summertime like they're just a couple of guys sitting there and he's just like hey pal they look like a couple of fucking assholes well they're doing the package slide under the table and there's the earpiece like given his background with terrorists popping up out of nowhere i think he's like his spidey sense is tingling a little bit he's just looking for somebody to shoot oh sure he's had the thrill of taking a human life and it has been two years to the best of our knowledge since that has happened Maybe he's done something behind closed doors, but he wants something public, something that's going to make the 10 o'clock news. I mean, if we're positing that Bruce Willis is a thrill killer, you're going to get no argument out of me. (laughs) 
Uh, um, actually, my doctorate work is in that very uh, subject in film school. Anyway, Bruce Willis then approaches a couple of these airport cops. Hey, pal. It's maybe a wild goose chase, but I just saw. And then one of the cops turns around. And it's that fat cop from New York or Chicago who's now working in D.C. Bruce Willis is like, oh, I mean, uh, I just saw Elvis. Elvis Presley. Yeah, that's the ticket. That's a 90s reference, right? All right. See you later, pal. So he decides to take the law into his own hands again. And meanwhile, uh, intrepid reporter Sam Coleman is trying to get some quotes out of these government types about Esperanza coming in. And then she notices Colonel Naked Bad Guy milling around in the airport. Hey, isn't that Colonel Naked Bad Guy? I hear that he practices Tai Chi when he stays at a Red Roof Inn. We should go interview him. She runs up to him and she's like, Colonel Naked Bad Guy, Colonel Naked Bad Guy, can I have a word? And he says... I'll give you two words, fuck and you, and then, which is pretty good. And then the Christopher Guest guy says, hey, you're a pinko bitch, and kind of shoves her out of the way. This was back when being aligned with the Russians was a bad thing, Bo. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know if you read the news lately. Kind of is again. Um, but it's really interesting because you have to kind of dig for the motives in this movie of, like, what do these terrorists want to accomplish? I still don't know. I figured it out on the second view was the time where i was like oh okay that's the reason for all of this but anyway we'll get to it in a minute yeah. so bruce willis meanwhile follows one of the dudes that was exchanging shit at the table to a locked door hey maybe there's somebody in here i could legally kill as a police officer that'd be fun i love having one of those murder boners I hadn't have that in like six eight weeks and he tries the door it's locked and then he looks at this baggage guy hey pal you got a key to this door? Why don't you open it up? I'm a cop. It's best as you know. R well, he, when the guy's like, no, I will not open this door for you. Come on. I'm going to go kill a couple assholes, pal. Right. He flashes his badge and then he's like, hey, how about you go get the airport police? I'm about to shoot a bunch of people. <laughs> right you tell him to bring some body bags and so he goes into i assume the baggage and random heat vent room yeah. as designed by tim burton it, it does it looks like the inner workings of the lower level of willy wonka that we never saw it's a lot of punka chinka punka chinka psh, psh. It's crazy. And so he sees one of the terrorists that he's been kind of stalking through the airport talking to another dude. And Bruce Willis, again, having no authority whatsoever in this situation, is like, hey, pal, you got any ID? And they just start shooting at him. And then he immediately shoots back. They're like, we've got ID. Yoink. And they just pull out <laughs> automatic weapons. And there is a prolonged gunfight that has a number of bullets flying around that a gun is physically incapable of holding. It's like watching Yosemite Sam give chase after Bugs Bunny in the Wild West. It's like when he uses his six shooters as rockets to shoot himself up into the air. Right. It is that level of realism. It's just a big old gunfight. Bruce Willis loses his gun uh, at one point, so he has to use a golf club to beat the shit out of one of the <laughs> dudes and he knocks that dude's radio free in the fight and he's like hey i remember in the last movie radios are important and so he <laughs> he hangs on to that then the other dude shows up and shoots at bruce willis and chases him onto this conveyor belt back room or whatever uh, -huh. uh he ends up jumping on that guy they fight some more then it turns into temple of doom where the bad guy gets crushed by a rolling pin rock smasher or something but this is just something that moves luggage along Bo. i don't know what this can contraption is it's broken i assume it's to get luggage compacted so it fits better on the <laughs> plane or something like who the fuck knows what this is then bruce willis gets on a bike yeah and he rides it side saddle he doesn't even pedal it yeah it, he rides it like a scooter <laughs> to tackle this other terrorist and then that terrorist gets away and the airport police draw down on bruce willis rightfully so hey pal i'm the good guy take my word for it lapd i think my id on its way to cleveland i killed a guy back there they ask him for some ideas like 
oh, I guess it fell out of my pocket. All I've got's this gun that I used to murder those people with. You're immediately going to jail. There's no questions being asked. This is over. There are moments where he just shows up and we'll get to it, but it's like, what are you doing here? Why are you not being locked up immediately? That's the central problem with this movie because in the original, which is a fantastic action film from that late 80s, early 90s era, in that movie, the character of John McClane, aka Bruce Willis, he was the victim of circumstance. He came across as an everyman. He was more realistic than most of the action heroes you were seeing on the silver screen. He was vulnerable. He could get hurt. Him walking on the glass with the feet. He was a good guy. He's trying to fix things and patch up his marriage with his wife. And like you were rooting for him. Here, the filmmakers watched that movie and they just extracted all of the shitty habits and tendency for unbridled killing and decided to like jam that in there and cock up the whole movie, regurgitate it out in this lackluster sequel. In the original Die Hard, from Jump, from the time that the terrorists show up, Bruce Willis is just trying to contact the police and save his wife. And when it turns out that the police are not going to get in, that's when he takes matters into his own hands. In Die Hard 2, he comes into this movie guns blazing. Arguably, he might have looked over and seen two men with hearing aids, where one shifted a package with his foot on the floor, and then he just went and murdered these people. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> We cut to the airplane where we discover that Walter Peck, the reporter from the first movie that Bonnie Bedelia punched out, is on the same plane as Bonnie Bedelia as fate and screenwriting would have it. Bo, I watched the original Die Hard a few weeks ago because we I knew this was coming up and I hadn't seen it in years. And then I watched Die Hard 2. I didn't even remember this character was in a movie that I'd watched weeks before. I don't know if that says more about me or more about the movie. What did he do in the original? The most significant thing he does is that his reporting on television like he goes to find bruce willis's family and that's when alan rickman puts together the fact that bonnie bedelia's kids are the same kids as the police officer inside and that's when he realizes like i have leverage against bruce willis now because of walter peck's reporting that is why he is significant in that movie that's why bonnie bedelia punches him is because he essentially almost fucked everything up he's a good asshole oh he's as your your intro pointed out he is maybe one of cinema's best assholes i used to get him and jeffrey jones mixed up and then jeffrey jones who was the principal from ferris bueller he did the child porno thing and then i clearly know that they're not the same person <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the stewardess is trying to get him back to his seat. And he's like, I think you know who I am. And she's like, yeah, you did that piece called Junkyard of the Sky about airplanes and also bimbos of the air or something. Uh -huh. She's trying to get him back in his seat. And he's like, uh, excuse me, stewardess, I cannot be placed here because I have a restraining order against Bonnie Bedelia. She humiliated me in public and she assaulted me. Oh, is that right? Is this true, Bonnie Bedelia? And she's like, yeah, I knocked out two of his teeth. The stewardess then says, would you like some champagne? Mm. And that's the whole joke. But it's just to establish Walter Peck is also on the plane. Yeah. And then that old lady's like, I'm going to taste him in the cock if he tries to get in my panties. <laughs> <laughs> and she is like the Catwoman for sure. <laughs> Meanwhile, Bruce Willis, back on the ground, is being handed his gun and ID back for no good reason. Uh, sorry for the inconvenience, but uh, here's your badge and your piece. We had to make sure you, that you were a real cap, you know? Uh, don't worry about any charges or investigation regarding that guy you killed. We got a dumpster out back for such an occasion. Can of kerosene, couple of matches. In case things don't really work out, we'll toss some heroin on top of him as a backup plan we're good on the uh forms we're just gonna check the box that says minority trust me <laughs> no one will ask any questions they wheel this bullet filled body out through the middle of the airport an intrepid reporter samantha coleman and her pinko commie cameraman they're there filming all this and john mcclain says to the only police officer standing around hey pal you gotta seal this place off it's a crime scene and the cop says hey that sounds like a pretty good idea but maybe we need to go ask the captain first bruce willis says take me to the captain i'll straighten him out 
know. Well, they're on the way to the captain, in quotes. <laughs> Colonel Naked Bad Guy's men are pickaxing the frozen ground outside this church. Uh -huh. And one of the dudes that we saw shooting it out with Bruce Willis, the one that got away, shows up. And he says, the mission was a success, but it was almost compromised. Colonel Naked Bad Guy pulls out his gun, puts it to this guy's head, and is like, you have disappointed me for the last time. And then pulls the trigger, but there's no bullet in the chamber. Just to scare the shit out of this guy, and he says, next time you fail me, the chamber will not be empty. Dismissed, goon number two, if that is your real name. And it's like, why are you being so mean? You catch a lot more flies with honey than vinegar, Colonel Naked Bad Guy. We come back to the airport police headquarters where we meet the captain, who is played by Dennis Franz. Welcome to Pick 6 Movies, long overdue. He's the head of this police force at the airport. And Dennis Franz, if you don't know who he is, just imagine someone doing the greatest impression impression of the city of chicago ever and that's dennis Franz. his name in the movie is carmine lorenzo which is pretty well, funny his full name is carmine lorenzo bratwurst low and brow the bears <laughs> and bruce willis is like hey dennis friends who's gonna go out there and do police work hey look hey i know who you are you're that guy who broke seven faa and five dc regulations running around by the airport all right you fucking killed the guy you got no jurisdiction here all right we got a, a drug lord dictator being extradited here the Globetrotters are playing their final game in luggage terminal D. We're holding a Comic Con out on the tarmacs of C&D. And did I forget to mention that's Christmas Eve, buddy? Look, it was probably just some punk stealing luggage. Oh, yeah? Well, that punk had a Glock 7. You know what that is? It's a ceramic gun that I just made up that can get through any metal detector. That's not some thug, man. Look, I know who you are, pal. You're that guy that was in Nakatomi Plaza. <laughs> I'm gonna... I want you to get the hell out of my office right now. I got a bratwurst to eat, and you're giving me an ulcer. Just because the TV thinks that you're hot shit don't mean that you're really just cold boogers on a paper plate, all right? <laughs> At best, you're warm diarrhea in a Dixie cup that bears the bulls. Get out of my airface! And Bruce Willis, on his way out, drops this little bomb bomb. Uh-huh. Where he says, hey, Lorenzo, let me ask you something. What sets off the metal detector first? The lead in your ass or the shit in your brains? Well, Bo, the answer is the lead in his ass. Yeah, Dennis Francis is like, look, that question makes absolutely no sense. First of all, the shit the shit in my brains would not set off a metal detector. Because unless you're drinking a heap load of Goldschlager, shit is never going to set off a, me a metal detector. You understand me, Bruce Willis? Now get the hell out of my office. As Bruce Willis walks away from Dennis Franz's office, he calls him a fat fuck. Yeah. Like, that's how you garner sympathy for your hero. Hey, I'm working on it, all right? I got myself that Noom app. It's supposed to help me track my eating <laughs> habits, but look, I'm not going to get into this conversation with you right now, Bruce Willis. You're really just being a real pain in my tuckus. Downstairs, Bruce Willis sees the corpse of the guy killed being rolled through the airport. Did they just take this body on a parade around all of the concourses as a warning sign to what happens if you dust up any trouble at the D.C. airport? Bruce Willis, who's an asshole? He busts up into the counter of this Avis car rental location, reaches over and just swipes an ink pad and a piece of paper from this female attendant who gives it a wait what you can't have that sir he rushes outside bruce willis yells at the two guys rolling away the man that he just murdered a few minutes ago and he goes hey pals hey i need to take this guy's fingerprints and he takes the the ink pad and rubs it over this corpse's fingers and then sloppily mashes it against this piece of paper taking a print that can never be used by anyone then we see that esperanza's plane is now on the way there's like a military escort that's following the cargo plane out of the central america joint where it takes off from yeah they peel off and we see him chained in the back and it's worth saying he's played by franco nero who was in a bunch of terrific like spaghetti movies terrific actor he looks like dos Equis most interesting man in the world he does and he looks like if that guy had a baby with famed cuban dictator fidel castro <laughs> That's good. Anyway, he's chained up in the back and he asks this guy who's guarding him, hey, can you take off my chains here? Because I'm trying to smoke a cigar. And the guy's like, eh, you're not going to fool me, Franco Nero. I've seen your shenanigans in movies before, but I will light it for you. So the guard lights up his, his cigar for him. You think that's going somewhere, but it doesn't. I guess it's how he gets him close enough to do his cigar foo later, but whatever. And then we cut back over to Colonel Naked Bad Guy at the church as a bunch of cables are being 
seen run to an electrical box there. It seems like a miss that they didn't include some piece of classical music like they did in the original, like the Ode to Joy, like if they would have used When Johnny Comes Marching Home, that would have been good or something like that. Just anything would have been great but you know they did want it to be too close to the original chad <laughs> and so speaking of al cowling is getting a call from bruce willis who and he's of course because the one thing we know about him is that he eats twinkies so he's got a desk full of twinkies that he's eating it's a lot of Twinkies. It's like four or five all over his desk. That's why he's so overweight, Bo, because he eats all those Twinkies. Yeah, that processed food is just no good yeah. for you. And Al is surprised when Bruce Willis is like, hey, I'm about to fax you some stuff that's going to be very difficult for you to read. He's like, wait a second, you're using a fax, Bruce Willis? Yeah, my wife said to wake up and smell the 90s. Ugh, all right, I guess Die Hard too. And anyway, Al says... Hey, are you pissing in someone else's pool, Bruce Willis? And he's like, yeah, and I'm fresh out of chlorine. Is that a clever retort, Bo? Because I don't think it's clever or a retort. It's as good as the metal detector line, which means it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. <laughs> no, it's like a bad fortune cookie. Yeah, if you follow that line to the conclusion, it's like, okay, so you're pissing in somebody's pool, but you have no way to disinfect it, is what <laughs> right? you're saying? And Al should have been like, John, John. Uh, are you smelling almonds and tasting pennies? We might need to get you medical attention. John McClain, he hangs up the phone at this car rental desk where he has commandeered the phone to call his buddy in California. This is also a place where he stole that ink pad and the paper earlier. And when he hangs up the phone, the woman behind the counter kind of throws him some fuck eyes. And then we cut to the air traffic control tower where former Tennessee Senator Fred Thompson, who was also the DA on Law and & Order, and I'm pretty sure he was in a few submarine movies, and he ran NASCAR in days of thunder see season episode pick six movies and fred thompson is there to lend an air of homespun authoritative leadership and thompson says look at here son we got a second storm coming in on top of a storm it's already been batting like a bucking bronco with spurs in his side and tobacco on his brattle what there is an argyle in this movie as well uh -huh. only instead of a limo driver he is some guy who works at the tower yeah he's the one who gets shit done he's talking to fred thompson about hey there's this big weather front moving in and fred thompson is like all right well won't you tell all them planes the line starts at the mighty mississippi and they better start taking numbers so sure as bloodhounds got fleas we got ourselves a kettle of grits and i don't like my grits burnt also yeehaw argyle's like i, I I can slow them down, sir, but we're going to need some time. Like, I can keep the plows running, but honestly, there's snow and drug dealers flying in. I, I heard rumor that somebody just murdered someone on Concourse C. There's a lot going on. And by the way, my kids are expecting me at home for Christmas. It's 430, sir, on Christmas Eve. <sighs> Okay, I'll do what I can. All right, well, I'm going to be here chewing tobacco and regaling the people of the tower with my homespun style of wisdom. <laughs> kind of like a Andy Griffith that drinks a lot of bourbon. Back on Bonnie Bedelia's plane, the captain comes over the loudspeaker. He's like, uh, uh, everyone, there's your captain. We may be in the air a little bit longer uh, than expected. Uh, stewardesses, uh, resume drink service and... Uh, We'll give you updates when we have it. So Bonnie Bedelia and that old woman. They just decided they're going to continue to get loaded. Because originally Bonnie Bedelia turns down some champagne. And as soon as she hears about the delay, she's like, you know what? How about you make it a double? Two glasses of champagne over here, please. Excuse me, old lady. Would you like one? Three glasses of champagne over here, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bruce Willis, meanwhile, has gotten a fax back from uh, Sergeant Al Cowley. Yeah, he's just hanging out at this Avis rent-a-car desk. And when the thing comes up on the fax machine, he just rips it off. He's such a dick. Oh, yeah, he completely commandeers this information desk. Al is like, hey, I don't know what you're getting into over there, but the guy that you shot is dead. And he's like, yeah, I know. I took great pleasure in it. He's like, no, no, I know you did. But no, I mean, he was dead before you shot him. Are you saying he's a zombie, Al? He's like, no, no. Is he an angel? You know, it's Christmas time. Did I kill the angel of the Lord on Christmas Eve? Man, I'm probably not going to get anything in my stocking this year. Holy shit, Al. Did I kill Michael Landon? What if I killed the 
the devil on Christmas Eve. Is that something that would give me a little present from Santa Claus? Maybe some more ammunition and some more innocent people that I could kill with that ammunition? Bruce Willis, what happened was this guy is using a fake ID. It sounds like this is, the way he puts it, is black bag stuff where this guy was reported dead and he's probably a mercenary for some Blackwater level kind of espionage bullshit. Right, so what what you're saying to me, Al Pal, is we're dealing with a Weekend at Bernie's 2 situation, so I'm free and clear, right? Santa's gonna come and I can still kill a whole lot of people. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna hang up now so I'm not an accomplice. Alright, don't eat any more Twinkies, you fat piece of shit! I hate you! Fuck off! Mary, go fuck yourself! And so when they hang up and the woman behind the <laughs> counter that was throwing some fuck eyes at him before is like, hey, big guy, you know, I get off at six. And Bruce Willis holds up the facts that he got from Sergeant Al Powell and is like, just the facts, man. Just the facts. Yeah. And there's a collective groan from everyone watching this, which, by the way, how sad would it be to have the Avis slash dollar rent a car attendant say, mm -hmm. hey, officer, I don't even know your name. You want to go somewhere and have the saddest sex imaginable on Christmas Eve with a person so desperate for human physical contact that I'm going to solicit sex from a stranger who might have just murdered someone? And what is the point of attraction here that he can send a fax and he can answer the phone when it rings? We're hiring $15 an hour. <laughs> it's head scratching. Sam Coleman, intrepid reporter Sam Coleman, uh -huh. sees Bruce Willis lighting a smoke. Hey, you're Bruce Willis from LA's Nakatomi Towers. I saw that dead guy earlier rolling around the airport. Is that your handiwork? Care to comment? Hey, how about you go fuck yourself? I get that a lot. I'm intrepid reporter Samantha Coleman, Action 8 News. Back to you, Chuck Porterhouse. I've been told that by both the protagonist and antagonist of this film. Everybody hates me. Meanwhile, cut to Dennis Fred's, our hero, complaining to Fred Thompson about like, hey, would you believe it? These news reporters are covering this murder that happened in our baggage area like it's some kind of crazy murder on Christmas Eve at an airport. Uh, listen up here, people. The National Airport is going to be shut down. We got to close this barn door for business before the farmer's daughter gets her britches down to her knees. And then, Chad, <laughs> Bruce Willis strolls into this control tower. Yes. Uninvited and unbidden. At Washington Dulles Airport, no less. Hey, pals, guess what? That guy that I shot down there, you're welcome. Looks like he's a terrorist. And they're like, what in the hell is this guy doing in the tower here? Don't I have any guards or police people or something? to keep this motherfucker out of here. <laughs> Bruce Willis, he hands over his crumpled piece of paper with smeared fingerprints on it. And there's like the dead goon's face. It was faxed back from Al Pal. And there's no context to any of this when he hands it to Fred Thompson and Dennis Franz. And they look at it. And then they look back at the paper. And then they look at each other. Then they look at McLean. Then back at each other. Then up at the ceiling, kind of waiting for one of the other <laughs> to speak first. And eventually somebody says, hey, hey, what the hell is this piece of paper? It doesn't even matter, all right? Look, we got a nor'easter pummel in this place on Christmas Eve. We got to also make sure that David Copperfield, who's scheduled to make a Boeing 747 disappear tonight out on the runway, we got to make sure that can go down on live TV, all right? I don't care about any of your bullshit as it relates to this murdered nobody zombie. Meanwhile, Chad, at our church, uh -huh. one of the thugs reports to Colonel Naked Bad Guy, they have these systems tapped, and their mini control room is now locked. Mm -hmm. And so we cut immediately back to the tower where fred thompson is like i don't understand what all this means well it's a bunch of chinese cuneiform for all i know and bruce willis says i'll tell you what it means pal somebody's about to seriously fuck with this airport we've got the resume of a mercenary and the world's biggest drug dealer on the way boys and girls we got ourselves a body in the morgue that's dead twice a trick that even jesus h christ couldn't pull off on a month of sundays during an indian summer Oh my God, did he just say Indian summer? Like, I've only been a traffic control operator here for like three weeks, but he says some racist shit. I don't even know what Indian summer means. Is that a thing? Is that racist? Everything that comes out of Fred Thompson's mouth is with that thick Southern accent. It's It feels like it's all dusted with a lot of racism. Is that just me? Oh, he definitely voted for Trump. I know he did. He told me that. He told he told me he sent in his mother's ballot and his mom is in a coma. He bragged about that in the bathroom and then he showed me his dick. 
It wasn't. All right, everybody. Oh, sh- here he comes. Let's go, Brandon. Let's get these lights on. Come on now. And Fred Thompson is like, all right, I want all the shift commanders to report in. And as soon as he says that, all of the runway lights just go completely dark. And Argyle is like, yeah, the backup systems aren't responding either. Meanwhile, back at this church, we've just got dudes like axing and chainsawing through these big ass cables. Uh huh. We cut back to Argyle, who's like, all the systems are dead. And Fred Thompson says, that's right, people. It's a code red oh my god code red what the hell does that even mean did you just make that up all right we have a bunch of planes circling this airport oh my there god. is no way for them to see the runway i want you to stack them pack them and rack them that's what he said to me in the bathroom when he showed me his his dick i'm scared to call hr I stacked them and packed them, but I would not rack them. Then Fred Thompson is like, all right, those planes are going to be dropping out of the sky pretty soon. Jesus Christ, he just said planes are dropping out of the sky. It, I'm supposed to be home with my family in like an hour. This, that's not going to happen. Ugh. Bruce Willis, is this what you expected? <laughs> no, nah, this is just the beginning. And then the FAA hotline phone starts ringing. Beep, 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 beep. And Fred Thompson grabs it. Hey, who is this? I'm as angry as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. And Colonel Naked Bad Guy is like, All right, Fred Thompson, I want you to know that we are in control of this airport. Esperanza's <laughs> plane is going to land. It will not be approached by anyone. Then you are going to get another plane. Hold, hold on a minute. I got to write this down. Esperanza's plane is land. When is it landing? Uh, pretty soon. Uh, are we all all the way back to step one? Yes, step one. Esperanza's plane will land. I wrote that down already. Shit. What's the next step? Step two. <laughs> step two. No one will approach his plane. All right. I don't even need to write that down. Go on. All right. <laughs> step three. You will have another plane. All right. What kind of plane do you need? I don't. A big one. All right. Fully fueled and placed at my disposal. Well, shit. I'm not going to give you a plane with no gas in it. That's just fucking stupid. All right. New plane full of gas. What else you need, buddy? You have 58 minutes to make this happen. Oh, shit. Did, hey, all our power went off. Is your power on at your house? Yeah, we did that. Uh, look, all you need to know is that if you attempt to restore any function uh-huh. to the tower yep. it will be met with severe repercussions hang on a second buddy oh sorry fellas Woo. wait was that a fart a shart or a shit it was all three rack them stack them and pack them that's what i say that's my that's my special order at waffle house <laughs> I get my my hash round stack packed and racked. That's where you cover them in sawmill gravy, put a little cayenne pepper on it, and punch me in the balls for good measure. Look, I I know that you guys are having a whole conversation here. I just wanted to chime in on that <laughs> stack pack and racking with the hash browns. You throw a little sausage in there, you got me on board. Hey, I think it sounds great. Who hey, who is this on the phone? You want to meet us at Waffle House here a little bit later? Have a little Christmas Eve. My wife and I got divorced a few years back. I don't think I'm gonna have anybody spend time but that's why i'm not too concerned about letting everybody off work tonight oh my god did he just say we're not getting off work tonight my wife is gonna kill me does that mean we're gonna get some delivery then and whatever you want just rack them stack them and pack them if you need some sausages or some low and brow or whatever the hell you drink we're good to go hey i got five dollars off any uber eats order over 35 so if you want me to go around and take some orders who wants something to eat how about you the fellow who wanted to see my dick in the bathroom the other day what are you hungry for thinks i wanted to see his dick oh my god I've got it. I'm quitting this job. I'm quitting this job. I'm going to hang up now. (laughs) So that'll happen in the movie. Yeah. And then Bruce Willis is like, hey, pal, my wife is on one of those planes. That puts me right on the playing field. And about this time, things get real chaotic in the tower. Dennis Franz, he gets called a fat ass again by Bruce Willis. And then intrepid reporter Samantha Coleman, she somehow gets past the incredibly lax, if even existent, security that prevents people from clearly (laughs) not making their way into the tower it's just a beaded curtain <laughs> separating the tower from the rest of the Put airport the pot leaf on it <laughs> yeah there's a, a handwritten sign that says 18 and over on like a half a manila folder that somebody ripped apart <laughs> It's what you used to see on the door in the back of the video store in the day. Like, ooh, that's where they keep the porno. (laughs) And so finally, Dennis France is like, okay, enough. Get (laughs) intrepid reporter Samantha Coleman and this Bruce Willis motherfucker out of this tower right now. 
And so they're finally let out, but left alone in an elevator, which is a recipe for trouble because <laughs> Bruce Willis then is just like, see you later, intrepid reporter Samantha Coleman, and climbs up through the roof of this elevator. And when it reaches the bottom, these guards are there like, hey, weren't there supposed to be two of you? I guess he didn't like the confined spaces or something. Anyway, I'm off to do some reporting. Bye, everyone. And that's where the questions end. <laughs> Nobody is like, wait a second. I'm pretty sure they said that two people were coming down from the tower and only one made it down i guess he disappeared maybe he was a ghost before he disappears she says i'm intrepid reporter samantha coleman and you're bruce willis and you killed a guy do you have anything you want to say and he's like yeah pal fuck off mm, i already got that quote from colonel naked bad guy earlier hey pal that's the guy i shoulder checked earlier in the movie for no good goddamn reason i didn't recognize him with all his clothes on and not doing tai chi in a motel six i know who that bad guy is pal and then that's when he pops up so he knows that the bad guy is a bad guy or something? yeah is a drug dealer or oh, whatever something. and he goes to the steam tunnels again yep and he says, another basement, another elevator. How can the same shit happen to the same guy twice? That's the first of three times that the movie acknowledges that it's a complete ripoff of the first <laughs> film. But, you know, I guess self-awareness is good. Was he in the basement in Die Hard? I thought he was in the skyscraper. He was way up in the air. But he was in air ducts and construction areas and shit like he got that. Confused. And fighting terrorists. Yeah. He, he got turned around. He's also a little drunk at this point. <laughs> if not on alcohol, <laughs> then on on nicotine and the <laughs> rush of endorphins that comes with murdering someone he wanders around in the basement steam tunnels and he hears the velvet singing of the andrew sisters coming from an lp playing where he finds airport simpleton marvin he says he's the janitor chad he does not work for the airport though. <laughs> No, he is just the phantom of the airport <laughs> who lives down there and plots his revenge or something. He's not collected a paycheck. He eats out of the dumpster and he survives on whatever he can find in the trash cans or that falls through the air vents on the floor. Right. He has eaten more than his share of rats. A hundred percent. That's why it's Thanksgiving, buddy. After Bruce Willis runs into Marvin, the janitor. Hey, pal, you seem like a weirdo. You want to help me? Okay. Fred Thompson radios all the airplanes and says uh look we're gonna delay everybody up there uh we're not gonna let anybody land for a little bit uh we need you to continue circling the airport in as dangerous a fashion as possible we got a squirrel in the hen house and the roosters no longer cock of the walk all these planes need to stay straight as a baptist preacher during gay pride week oh my god did you hear that like seriously you can't say that kind of shit today I, he said cock and gay pride like ugh. I hate working here. I knew I should have never moved to D.C. I should have stayed in Oklahoma, but I thought, you know what? I'll go to D.C. It'll be a step in my career. And it's just a nightmare with him. So earlier, Fred Thompson had told Argyle to get a transmitter working. So they're going to this, uh, some radar array thing that is, a, is is in part of the airport that is still under construction. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's as good a description as anything else. And so he's on the move, as are this like airport SWAT team, making their way through this construction area area a la the first movie it's nice that the airport does have a SWAT team on standby because that's something that's never happened ever well Dennis France at one point says like we've got the best people here including some highly trained SWAT individuals who have guns and vests and I think badges <laughs> so I want you to get the fuck out of here so Bruce Willis is down in the tunnels with Marvin uh, self-appointed airport janitor Marvin right and he says Marvin are you gonna be able to get me to this annex skywall Okay, if that's what you want to do, okay. That's going to be a great place for an ambush. I got to get there and stop it. You want some of this rat? I cooked it with the big lighter I found. You know what? Hang on to that for me. I, I keep drinking, and eventually <laughs> that's going to be a good idea. Sure enough, while Ar Argyle and, uh, and the airport SWAT team are en route, the SWAT team is like, don't even worry about it, Argyle. We got your back. And he goes, yeah? Who's got your backs? And they're like, well, nobody. We're the SWAT team. That's how it works. Yeah, yeah we, we're the people who have other people's backs. Well, who, who has the backs? of those people i i don't understand the premise of your question because we're like you call us in when you need your back watched right but who watches your back that's what i want to know we watch each other's backs is that good enough for you can we just keep walking okay is someone behind you oh 
we do get to see Bruce Willis take some schematics that self-appointed airport janitor Marvin gives him, and he gets into more ventilation ducts, just like Die Hard. There's a whole lot of motherfucker and goddamn it being thrown around here as well. There is a lot of that in the first movie as well, because Officer John McClane's a bit of a potty mouth. Uh -huh. But it's <laughs> usually when he's fighting someone, like when he's having that fight with Alexander Gudinov in Die Hard, he is just like, I'll kill you, you motherfucker, you know. Here he's by himself. Right. Just like, motherfucker, goddamn damn it that's not necessary this is just hearing me climb a hill you know of just being angry at nobody but myself <laughs> trying to put on your socks in the morning oh goddamn motherfucker <laughs> the SWAT team in Argyle reached this annex building and it turns out that Robert Patrick star of Lost After Dark get your digital copy today they're there with a whole bunch of other goons and I think John Leguizamo might be a bad guy running around he's in this movie but if you blink you'll miss him I did the plan here as we learn is that they anticipated this was the move that they were going to make from the tower is to go for this radar array because it's the logical thing to get online to talk to the planes so that is going to lure the airport SWAT team into this choke point at which point Robert Patrick star of Lost After Dark get your digital copy today please and uh, or a thousand of them would be great but with them dressed as painters they can turn around and just kill all those guys and so therefore neutralize the greatest threat left at the airport which is presumably this SWAT team and then that's what happens there's a big gunfight and this was my favorite part of the movie because I didn't have to take any notes or pay attention at all yeah there's a lot of a lot of bad action here as a matter of fact my favorite is when Bruce Willis jumps from the vents uh starts shooting everybody uh -huh. and then just rolls around on the ground like the McKenzie brothers doing a cannonball coming yep it's all a bunch of action he ends up saving Argyle everyone else is dead mm -hmm. and that's where Bruce Willis is like yeah this was all a ploy to make Dennis Franz waste all of his best men and time because you know he's super detective john mcclain sure okay we cut back up to the plane where walter peck is noticing out the window that a bunch of airplanes are flying around and bonnie bedelia is like are you supposed to be this close to me dick that is your name isn't it and he's like uh yes it is but i'm just thinking of the people and she says the only time you think of the people dick is when you look down to see what you're stepping on this sounds like dialogue from a porno dude it is so badly written and i know this is written by the guy who wrote the original die hard but it's the kind of writing you get when someone is like hey you know that really good script you wrote make another one of those just like it but different yeah okay i'll do what i can i guess and then you get die hard too john mcclain now has his hands on a radio that's used by the bad guys again because that happened in the first movie but the signal is scrambled so it's of no use Bo. we cut to colonel naked bad guy and he hears that his henchmen have taken out the swat team they've blown up the antenna and colonel naked bad guy he's pretty happy about all that but he's upset that he lost a bunch of his men in the firefight which what did you expect to happen colonel naked bad guy he calls up dulles tower and he says listen up fuck nuts i told you not to restore contact with airplanes now you will play the penalty colonel naked bad guy also at this point states the motive of the movie which is that esperanza was an anti-communist ally and despite Despite being a drug dealer and everything that basically them extraditing him and punishing him is turning their back on an anti-communist regime okay which they need in central america or whatever but then john mcclain he grabs a different radio that's not re related to the bad guys and he calls back up to the tower and he says listen up pal we got dead officers down here you son of a bitch and dennis franz hears this and says hey listen up here yeah bruce willis star of die hard one and hero of the knuckle down we tower us to stink over you stay out of the bears the bulls <laughs> And what Colonel Naked Bad Guy is doing is basically talking a plane into landing or letting a plane know like you're cleared for landing, but they have reset the ground in, through their control room instruments or whatever to negative 200 feet. So ground level is now like where the plane thinks it's going to land is 200 feet lower. Yeah. Colonel Naked Bad Guy, he gets on the horn and he's talking to this plane and it's like, Kamikaze Airlines, uh, Flight 414. 
on approach to Dallas. You're cleared to uh, crash into the ground below. I mean, oh, shit. You're, land your plane. But boy, it's just going to be a good one. He contacts the most British airline ever, where they're like having tea and crumpets yeah. in the cockpit. And Cole Meany, who you may or may not remember from a bunch of Star Trek stuff, he's like, oh, I'm so glad you called. We're running out of petrol up here. <laughs> On the plane, one of the stewardesses is saying something like, we're like the British Rail, love. We might be late, but we'll get you there on time. We will. It is awful writing. Yeah. Yet again. But Bruce Willis overhears all this and he's like, why are they doing this, pal? That's stupid. They're going to crash into the ground and argyle points out like they think they're talking to us so there is no reason that they would not come barreling towards the earth right and crash and kill everyone and bruce willis is like i got an idea pal give me your coat it was a gift for my aunt i mean i really like my coat i'm gonna need it i'm gonna be out there doing hero stuff uh, right, make sure you bring it back okay so he grabs a can of paint thinner a couple of metal poles and some rags runs out onto the runway and lights these torches yep trying to wave this plane off doesn't work bo well fred thompson sees him from the tower and is just like what is that crazy son of a bitch up to but sure enough the plane doesn't see him in time it goes crashing right into the earth the co everybody in the cockpit screams the plane explodes and bruce willis cries like a baby in the snow let's pause here for a moment when this thing explodes it is though it is full of c4 barrels of gunpowder and flammable chemicals and fireworks it kills 230 passengers the three people in the cockpit and at least four to six cabin crew on Christmas Eve in Washington, D.C., Bo. This movie is over at this point. I mean, it's over. The military would be on top of this within a matter of minutes. This movie stops now. Sadly, we have almost a full <laughs> hour of this nonsense to go. This movie is over. Well, and Colonel Naked Bad Guy wraps up this scene by calling the tower and says, this concludes our lesson for the evening. And Fred Thompson is like well for this evening what's the meridian on this after midnight is there another lesson coming am i going to be visited by three ghosts i got a gremlin here and i'm still trying to figure out when i can stop feeding him give him a piece of pizza boys he looks hungry it's christmas after all god damn it do not get him wet oh shit did you just sneeze on that gremlin does that count boys uh, it doesn't seem to be bubbling or nothing give it time give it time don't wipe him off with a wet wipe you idiot oh now he's bubbling shit as if we didn't have enough trouble already dun 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 Oh, shit. I got a tower full of gremlins, a terminal full of terrorists, and I got some crazy New Yorker who moved to Los Angeles because his wife took a job out there running around killing all of them. <laughs> where are we all right so a rescue crew arrives <laughs> and bruce willis is holding this burned up doll from the flight and they're like uh can we have that that's uh evidence we're gonna need that for the faa uh when they do their investigation and fred thompson is like argyle i want you to figure out a way to warn those planes and argyle's like uh i don't think we could do that we just killed a bunch of people trying he's i don't care god damn it get one of them gremlins the nice looking one and then get out there and figure it out what about the one dressed up as a lady gremlin maybe she's more more your speed bruce willis has made his way back to the airport and he's sitting around he's looking all sad and he's smoking a cigarette and then he's trying to flush out all of the highly toxic carcinogens that blew into his lungs as he wandered around the smoldering wreckage of a 747 and fred thompson comes over and says ah, mclean i know exactly how you must feel hey, wait a minute no i don't i have no idea how you feel i got a hen house full of scrambled eggs going on in my head right here and bruce willis says look my wife's plane is still broadcasting up there but she's gonna run out of fuel soon isn't she fred thompson and he's like oh yeah she is almost certainly gonna die bruce willis uh i wish i could tell you different but it looks bad yeah, real I, bad I, also the government's coming in to do something counterterrorism. i really wasn't paying attention i got this list of three things i'm supposed to do for this other fella to fill up a plane with fuel and not get in the way or something and i'm still stuck on step one anyway the government's gonna show up in the next i don't know four or five hours or ten minutes and you know how the government is you know they're gonna probably take things over your wife maybe got 90 minutes of fuel then she's gonna crash out yonder and um things are not looking good bruce willis not looking good at all for you or my professional career in aviation it is going to extinguish itself out 
Listen, pal, what are all these bubbles of fur coming off of this little rat? You know what? If you put that over near that air vent, turn around and say hoop de doo three times, the rat will disappear and you'll smell fur burning in a minute. Legend has it. <laughs> There's a mysterious ghost janitor that runs around this place and, and eats up all the rats. It's singing a little song, though. I kind of like it. Shit, I've never seen nothing like that before. Is this a mogwai? Did you get a mogwai in here? A mogwai? I hadn't seen one of those since I was in Vietnam. Oh, my God. Seriously, he says shit like this all the time. I just, I can't work here anymore. Meanwhile, on Bonnie Bedelia's plane, she calls Walter Peck a dick a couple more times. That's funny. And says if he gets closer, he needs a different aftershave and stronger mouth wash and that's all that happens in that scene the military show up and they are led by actor john amos who was the dad on good times for the first season and then they killed him off leading his wife florida to break a glass bowl after his funeral and shout damn 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 <laughs> R.I.P. James Evans. He was also the dad from Coming to America who had that McDonald's knockoff for those of you that are under the age of 50 or something. Two helicopters land and a team of special forces hop out to take care of this situation. And by situation, I mean a 747 fully loaded with people on Christmas Eve that just crashed into planet Earth. You would think there would be more people than just this ragtag group of like eight people, right? Like thousands of emergency workers there immediately, Bo? Yeah. I mean, like you said, this would immediately be the highest priority in the United States of America at the moment. Coast to coast, yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, intrepid reporter Sam Coleman has reported on this tragedy while Colonel Naked Bad Guy and his men are watching the report. Up on the plane, Walter Peck asks uh, one of his tech guys, hey, did you put that receiver in baggage claim? Fuck no, I didn't. I'm not going to trust these people with our delicate equipment. And he's like, good, good. I need you to uh, get the frequency tuned into your little device here. And he's like, yeah, look, all I'm getting from the tower is a beacon. It's like the tower isn't there at all. And he's like, well, you tell me when you get something then. And that'll pay off later because Argyle has now been brainstorming with his team. Right. And someone is like, hey, what about the outer marker? And he's like, I don't have time for all this outer. Oh, yeah. Outer marker. Wait a minute. We'll pump up the wattage on that thing and we'll use the outer marker beacon instead of it just beeping to let planes know that they're reaching the outer marker, whatever the hell that is. We'll change the beep to us telling them, hey, we've got a problem here at the airport with terrorists and if you try to land you're going to get blown up. Bruce Willis and Dennis Franz, they go over and meet this new group of government special forces. And Bruce Willis says to Major John Amos, say, pal, isn't Colonel Naked Bad Guy one of your men? I'm like, how does he know this? How, how does he know these people and their military history together? I have no idea where this comes from. I also like the fact that there's a new guy that's like, hey, I'm really having a great time with all <laughs> you special forces guys. Yeah. Man, it's really fun to be with you. The other guy I called out sick but he'd been with you forever it's too bad that he's not here and instead it's me the new guy that doesn't really know all of you very well bruce willis heads back to the steam tunnels where he finds self-appointed airport janitor marvin roasting a mogwai with a bic lighter bruce willis says hey pal uh, you gotta get me up to the briefing room with the military i need to know what's going on marvin he pulls out a map to show him how to get to the briefing room via the air ducts of course mm -hmm. but then we see that marvin has one of the bad bad guys radios that is not scrambled uh bruce willis can now hear what the bad guys are up to kind of like what happened in die hard one Bo. very similar also it turns out that walter peck once argyle and his team start broadcasting from this outer beacon walter peck and his flunky now are listening in so they now know on bonnie bedelia's plane what's going on at the terminal this is so complicated colonel naked bad guy gets word that esperanza and his tiny cigars and his neatly trimmed beard they are on approach and Colonel Naked Bad Guy tells the tower, we're lighting up a runway. Do not try to land your planes or we will crash more planes or something, something, something over and out. So we come back to the plane with Esperanza. Remember, he's being extradited to the United States on Christmas Eve boat. That's right. <laughs> Esperanza, he is now strangling that guard that was assigned to watch him. Things went south real fast. I don't know how he got out of his handcuffs and his leg cuffs. Maybe it's magic. Now, once he choked him out, he got the keys off the guy. There's one shot that tells you that that happened all right because rennie harlan great cinematographer not much of a director
Esperanza goes to the cockpit and he pulls a gun out and puts it to the pilot's head and he says, Hola, amigos. You will do exactly what the tower instructs you. And I'm like, wait, is Esperanza going rogue here? Was this part of their plan that he's going to get out of his handcuffs and then hijack this plane? Yeah, what if he never gets out of the handcuffs? Right! I, I guess at that point they land and... He shoots the gun and the co-pilot lunges for his weapon and then they blast out the front window of the cockpit of this plane and Goldfinger bow, a bullet went through a window and sucked that fat bastard out into the wild blue yonder. Here we get just like a, a nice breeze, you know, in the chilly december 25th air three thousand feet up in the sky right it's just blowing a bunch of snow into the cabin or whatever but the idea is that he's a little lower to the ground because he lands pretty quick after this yeah, esperanza lands it yeah he kills the pilot and co-pilot then he just gets behind the controls and is like i will take care of this click 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 this is alfalfa to clubhouse i have no visibility i am a <laughs> I'm in a snowstorm that is blinding. There is no cabin pressure. A bullet has damaged all the instruments. The plane might be upside down, like Denzel Washington in that movie where he was a drunk. Why are there crows and bats flying everywhere? There is a monster on the wing of the plane. They're gremlins pulling wires out of everything, but I will land this plane. I am Esperanza. <laughs> and while that drama is happening, Bruce Willis <laughs> asks Marvin, Hey, pal, what's the quickest route to the runways? If you tell me, I'll get you a liner for your coat, you cold poor bastard <laughs> and he's like oh i can help you out run down yonder go down this way if you go too far come back and go that way hey thanks pal colonel naked bad guy and his men light up this new runway there is no reason to have this detail in the movie it really feels like a plan to help santa get to the ground to save christmas <laughs> yeah so they light up a new <laughs> runway that he could land on and bruce willis is popping up through a grate in the runway yeah and almost gets run over by the plane but surprise surprise chad he gets out in the nick of time thank god and then he just goes running after it as it parks in the snow what's his end game here this is a man being extradited by the federal authorities he's gonna what shoot him <laughs> i think he's just gonna shoot the plane until it surrenders <laughs> Esperanza opens the door to the plane and it's a pretty impressive landing that he pulls off and he goes ah freedom and Bruce Willis says hey pal and he punches Esperanza right in the face shockingly when this happens it doesn't knock out Esperanza who recovers pretty quick and he's like hello hola who are you hey I'm a cop I'm the good guy and you're the bad guy and I'm gonna trade you for my wife what also how does that make him the good guy before you think about this misguided logic too long Colonel naked bad guy shows up in a jeep with a bunch of henchmen they just start shooting up the joint yeah. and bruce willis has to run into the cockpit bruce willis does shoot esperanza in the shoulder then in one of the smarter moves of the movie all of these terrorists just lock bruce willis in the cockpit yep. and chuck a bunch of grenades in there <laughs> you're like well this is a problem that's going to take care of itself it's a good dozen grenades all go through the broken open window of this cockpit golf club to these gentlemen for being able to throw those grenades through this open window it would take me dozens of tries to get one in but they're just like sinking them like it's nothing well they're paid mercenaries also they spent a lot of time at that carnival game with the uh, basketball hoop <laughs> every single one of them won the big stuffed animal so if that tells you anything bruce willis is in the cockpit yeah and this is absolutely the Die Hard 2 equivalent of the scene in Die Hard where he jumps off the roof with the fire hose yes except this time he jumps into one of the pilot seats and as the grenades explode he pulls the ejection seat and it's kind of the scene from as i remember it the trailers of this movie yeah where you see this giant fireball and him flying towards the camera hey and a, yeah in a not great green screen effect can you imagine working for the ntsb on this christmas eve this is the second major airline explosion to happen at dulles international airport in the last hour on christmas eve what the fuck is going on dennis francis in the tower like okay i got even odds we get a third plane goes up 
Okay, who was with me? Two to one. All right. <laughs> Look, I know it's a tragedy and all, but you know the house always wins. Our bad guys hop in their jeep and they scramble off to go to to church. Cut to Bonnie Bedelia's plane, where a stewardess goes to the cockpit and she says, <clears throat> "Sorry, guys. Everyone in the back is a little antsy. Some of them are actually shitting themselves because we've seen two. Yes, I said two planes explode on the ground in the last hour, and I noticed that there's a flashing right in front of you that says no fuel." Um, next to the in case of emergency glass that normally contains three bottles of Jameson and it's those are gone. I also noticed that the backup copy of the New Testament you keep over here is missing. Can I get an update? Just what's happening, guys? Everything's fine. Everything is real good. All right. Thanks so yeah, much. You just thanks a lot. Thanks, Brian. Wonderful. I can't wait. Tell tell Janie I said Merry Christmas. Okay. Good to hear Will things do. are going well. All right. Bye bye. And she notices not only are they running low on fuel, but that Walter Peck is furiously making notes as he's listening to his radio yeah. and then grabs a phone runs into the bathroom and demands to talk to the anchor that's about to go live on television which i've already covered this in our episode on pottersville that is not how local tv news works on christmas eve it is a skeleton crew with a bunch of canned bullshit you don't call up and say that you want to talk to the head producer and go live on tv it's not gonna happen meanwhile back at the tower bruce willis is letting james evans and crew know Look, Esperanza is hurt. I think I killed about six terrorists. Maybe it was 20 or 25. I don't know how to count. And James Evans is giving him a bunch of shit for meddling in all of this. Mm -hmm. And I also like Dennis Fran saying, hey, that would be great if we knew how many terrorists there were to begin with. There could be 200 of them guys running around. Oh, 200 for real? Give me some more bullets. I want to kill some people. But Argyle has successfully let everybody know, don't land thanks to Colonel Naked Bad Guy's shenanigans. This is another trailer moment where James Evans tells Bruce Willis, you're the wrong guy in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, with the wrong ideas and the wrong approach and the wrong name and the wrong college degree. You got the wrong size batteries. You got the wrong connecting cable and you got the wrong currency to get any shit done. Hey, pal, it's the story of my life. Let's go kill some people. So Argyle sneaks over and is like, hey, Bruce Willis, I think I know where the terrorists are hanging out. Let's go kill them. I got bullets and guns. Come on, I'll give you a gun. You can, have you ever killed somebody? When you kill anybody, you get an erection. It's like wood. It makes you feel like a god, pal. When you see life disappear from a man's eyes and you cause that, it's the greatest feeling in the world, man. I call it the Nakatomi syndrome. I came up with that me. I was in Nakatomi Plaza two years ago. I killed all these people. I walked around with a boner for like a year and a half. In my favorite moment of the movie, Chad, we cut to the plane where this old woman is talking with Bonnie Bedelia about how pissed off she is that they haven't landed yet. And she's like, I can't believe they do this to us and bonnie bedelia is like well who are you gonna blame for something like this you know we just the weather and all that and she says oh, i'll probably blame that porker willard scott yeah why is willard scott getting hit with some shrapnel <laughs> It called a porker, no less. <laughs> and then Body Bedelia is kind of wondering aloud, like, I wonder if we have enough gas for all of this to be up in the air this long. And anyway. You talking about him being called a porker? I run a lot. I've run a bunch of marathons and I've always been a runner. One time I was running down the street in this neighborhood. I was running along and there were these three, four kids up front. One of them goes like, hey, look at this tubby guy. Tubby, where do you think you're going, tubby? And I'm like, look around, like thinking they're yelling at one of their friends. And all of a sudden I was like, hey, he's yelling at me. Yeah. He's like 10 years old. And as I run by he's giving me shit and i was like i can't do anything if i say anything or punch him i'm gonna go back to jail and so i just sort of took <laughs> my lumps still think about that kid to this day yeah man kids are mean he called a grown man tubby just a dude running down the street a true story chad <laughs> My five-year-old nephew, soon to be five-year-old nephew, uh -huh. the first time he met my girlfriend was like, is that your mom? <laughs> and then we pointed out very quickly, no, no, that is not my mother. You know, this is the, the woman in my life. And he still does it, Chad. Every time he sees her, and he knows better, he's just fucking with her. Kids are dicks. <laughs> they really are. I mean, it's funny. But uh, it is a real asshole move. That I get some mileage out of that. <laughs> so Argyle and Bruce Willis are now on the move and have apparently been searching everywhere. The movie is gracious enough not to show us all the false alarms. But they're like, yeah, this is the last spot, this old church. It's at the Serpent's Temple of New Hope. <laughs> 
out on old abandoned airport road old terrorist road and bruce willis <laughs> sees this guard on patrol outside the church and he points it out he's look there's a guy and argyle is like well maybe it's just a security guard for this church in the middle of nowhere yeah i'm gonna kill him we'll find out later the security guards in the middle of nowhere walk over their own steps and it's like I maybe I've done weird stuff like that in my life. Sometimes it's a game you play. Like, can I go back in my own footsteps? I did it. I'm going to kill you, motherfucker. Yeah, he tells Argyle, <laughs> go ahead and call those army guys. Meanwhile, I'm going to go beat the shit out of them this guy and so just jumps the fence and runs over to the guy there's also a quick scene where we do see major james evans and his team they have a chance to change their clothes and put on these all white snowsuits which makes them look a little like a wintertime ku klux klan and they're all running around they hop in this truck and they're on their way to the serpent's temple of new hope on terrorist airport drive as they're all loading up and getting in this truck on the way to <laughs> old terrorist road one uh, james evans looks at the new guy with a look that's like oh shit i'm gonna have to kill that guy aren't i oh well this sure is great being out here on my first mission i hope you guys can really show me the ropes <laughs> we'll show you the ropes all right huh that sounded ominous <laughs> meanwhile bruce willis is fighting this guard tooth and nail no one inside has heard any of this apparently no, it's it, and it's meat from the porkies movies that he's beating the shit out of and then this whole thing culminates with bruce willis grabbing a monster sized icicle uh -huh. And he just stabs it in the eye of this guy and snaps it off. And it is like something out of Friday the 13th. It is yeah. gruesome. It's out of place for this movie. Aside from the old woman calling Willard Scott a porker, it's my second favorite thing in the film. And, <laughs> but yeah, so Bruce Willis retreats after it takes him 20 minutes to kill one dude with an icicle uh -huh. and notices that the army has shown up. James Evans is there along with Dennis France, who has tagged along apparently. Uh -huh. and he's like i can't believe that you went in there on your own bruce willis no nah, no nah, that's not me that that's not me did you ever see a christmas story this guy shot his eye out you can't fool me an icicle fell and hit him in the eye like that kid that's why he's dead this was no bb gun i know a bb gun when i see it this was an icicle that you grabbed and took me right in the eye and james evans is like listen dennis france shut the fuck up and uh you know bruce willis here is a hero it's been two years since i've been called the hero and i was at nakatomi tower two years ago killed a bunch of guys and got an 18 month boner that's crazy little secret i got a boner now you want to see it <laughs> fred thompson asked me to see his earlier i said yes he hadn't killed anybody so he had a limp dick not me my dick is hard as a rock inside the church shed these terrorists have gotten hip to the fact that they're being surrounded by army guys. Sure. And so they're like, all right, well, let's get ready to blow all of this shit up. They swap ammo noticeably. Yeah. And then the fight is on. Everyone, please make sure you put in the clips that have the blue tape on the outside. A firefight ensues. Mm -hmm. The army bus in. They notice that there are booby traps on all of the equipment and they evacuate everybody out. Meanwhile, Bruce Willis is like i can't sit around and let everybody have the fun killing all these people it's time for me to get in on the action uh -huh. and so he shoots a dude grabs a snowmobile corporal naked bad guy and his team are escaping on snowmobiles so bruce willis grabs one of these and gives chase snowmobiles they're the jet skis of the snow absolutely there is a scene man that is one of the most ridiculous things i've ever seen in a movie where they're literally jousting with machine guns on these snowmobiles that's also the point where bruce Bruce Willis is like, I know I should have shot the shit out of that guy, and I didn't. I wonder why. But before he can put two and two together, uh, they start shooting at him with actual bullets. He goes into the air, at which point the snowmobile explodes in midair, throwing Bruce Willis clear. Isn't it over like an 18-wheeler tractor trailer or something? And the uh, ball of fire something? Maybe. It's outrageous. Like, it's one of those things, you know, as you pointed out in the intro, one of the things that made Die Hard so great is that it was a hero that got the shit kicked out of him, and all of the stuff he did was crazy, but it was also within the bounds of 
of reason. Yeah. Whereas in this movie, he's just invulnerable. Like he is ejected out of a fireball created by grenades. He almost got run over by a plane. He got shot off an exploding snowmobile. It is just absurd. Right. They're doing all of the things wrong. All of the things that made Die Hard great, they are doing the opposite of that. Right. Colonel Naked Bad Guy says, so much for the element of chance. Which is one of those sayings that sounds like it should mean something, but it doesn't. Again, it's just, yeah. it's bad fortune cookie speak. Hard work is the sake of itself. What does that mean? Belief is half the measure of truth. Really? Is it? I don't know. Read my lucky numbers in the back. Let's play lotto. Knowledge is half the battle. The other half is winning. Huh? Bruce Willis, he's beside himself. And he's, hey, pal, I shot that guy. I had him dead in my sights. Look, I've murdered men from twice the distance while riding a mechanical bullet to state fair. There's no way I didn't shoot that guy. And then he pulls out the clip. He says, no way. Can't be. If these are, and then that, then I gotta, oh, I gotta tell somebody about this. Hey, pal. Man. At this point, it's unclear kind of what's going on. And unless you're really paying attention, this is all very confusing. I don't understand when they show Bruce Willis and he's like, wait a minute, this is what he should have just said. They're shooting blank. So you're like, oh, I'm an idiot. That's what's going on here. Yeah, but then we don't get the fun moment later where he shoots at Dennis France. Oh, you're right. You're right. Because he almost kills Dennis France. Yeah. So Corporal Naked Bad Guy then messages the tower uh -huh. and is giving James Evans a little bit of shit of like, listen, I, I, yes, I work for you, but I have learned some new tricks since then. I will kill you dead. And we're not friends at all. And we definitely don't like to play poker together on Thursday. So shut up about that. Uh, we're going to a hangar. Wink, wink. Don't come follow us. Cahoots is not something that we have ever been in together. <laughs> I do not have your phone number saved on speed dial. You were not the best man at my wedding six months ago. I definitely do not have a special ringtone just for your texts. Then there's a bit where we see Walter Peck on the phone in the airplane where he is setting up a report from the bathroom in the, of this plane. Uh -huh. But it's just to let us know like, oh, hey, remember this thing that's happening? It's, it's still going to happen in a minute, but not yet. Then on this transport, Chad, James Evans and his crew are all like, yeah. Yeah, we're gonna get these guys at the hangar and the new guy is like boy i sure wish i could have been with you back in the days you know when you guys were in grenada and whatnot and james evans is like yeah i wish that was true too then i wouldn't have to do this do what sir and then he just he cuts this guy's throat yep Again, a really gruesome effect for this movie. Agreed. And it's out of place. If only there had been more of it, I would have enjoyed this movie more. But yeah, so he's dead. And then they get a radio from uh, Colonel Naked Bad Guy who's like, you have a green light to join us at the hangar. It turns out we have been in cahoots. We have always been in cahoots. You complete me, James <laughs> Evans. Back in the steam tunnels, Bruce Willis is running around and he falls down a flight of stairs to where Marvin, our mysterious self-appointed airport jam, Janitor. he's there and he's whistling a happy tune and bruce willis shows up and he's all out of breath and he's beat to shit and then on the tv the producer goes live with walter peck from high in the sky above dulles airport which is beyond the scope of anyone's imagination that any tv station would do something like this on christmas eve and he's giving the whole report about like yeah this is walter peck yet again we have joined the sad fraternity of terrorist activity here at dulles national airport there are a bunch of planes flying around it's a really bad scene back to you ken here's the problem with this shit two planes have already blown up at washington dulles and they're not reporting on that that's your story who gives a shit about this guy up in the air right like all of this should be already all over every news when he starts reporting this all of the people in the airport they just go <laughs> silent you know to listen to to what he's gonna be saying dude once word gets out and this place goes nuts it becomes the movie airplane <laughs> yes like there's a baby thrown up into the air it's wonderful but back in the tower bruce willis is letting everybody know like i can't believe this they were using blake so long and dennis france is like look there is no way that james evans was gonna look me in the eye like that and just lie to my face no way he and i shared a hot dog together he and he likes spicy relish i like the sweet but we compromised he is a good man and he's a servant to this country and so to prove <laughs> <laughs> that they were using blanks bruce willis just shoots at him with this machine gun yeah and dennis friends cowers from these bullets uh, naturally i'm not the way that you do when someone shoots at you ending your life but there is 
zero chance that his pants are clean on the other side of no this. he he shits himself and there are visible stink lines above him like how does he do that that's what happens in cartoons he pulls it off because he's such a good thespian now convinced finally he's like all right everyone it's time to kick a little ass you're like all right i guess dennis rads <laughs> this is the scene where on the heels of walter peck's report the airport has turned into chaos word has gotten out on the plane also and bonnie bedelia is is like i'm gonna fix this walter peck son of a bitch once and for all uh -huh. and swipes the taser from the old lady's purse and goes full cat woman and just electrocutes his dick yeah she tases the shit out of him and knocks him at like eyes open i think she kills him <laughs> at least stops his heart for a minute meanwhile dennis franz and his team descend on hangar 11 while everyone in the airport is screaming and running smashing windows looting the duty free shop it is insanity by the way why weren't these people already freaking out because two planes just blew up on the tarmac outside yeah right we also get the reveal that dennis francis brother is the cop that was giving bruce willis a ticket outside the airport because of course and the way they do this reveal is that bruce willis dennis franz and his brother all get in the front seat of the patrol car at the same time like that seems a little weird right wouldn't one just get in the back just to have a little leg room my third favorite thing about this movie is when these three knuckleheads take off to go after the terrorists uh-huh they immediately run into a taxi yeah and dennis franz comes out and just goes completely dennis franz on this taxi driver yeah where he's like you dumb motherfucker you get this taxi <laughs> this piece of shit get it out of here right now i swear to god i'm gonna shoot you right in a dick hole get this taxi gone <laughs> i loved it man it was just like dennis franz improv and then bruce willis he gets out of the patrol car and he sees intrepid reporter samantha coleman across the way and he says hey pal it's me bruce willis star of the movie i like the fact that intrepid reporter sam coleman also says i'll tell you what bruce willis if you give me this story i will have your baby and he says that's not the kind of rat i'm looking for pal everybody wants to fuck him in this movie uh, apparently so and it really is the return of bruno the bad guys are in this giant cargo jet now and esperanza is flying the damn thing um he's had quite a day you know Bo. he was extra extradited to the united states he strangled a guy he shot two pilots he landed a plane with no instruments or visibility in a snowstorm he got shot in the shoulder by bruce willis he tossed not one but two grenades in through a broken window of a plane and then watched it explode he rode bitch on a snowmobile some days you wake up and you just don't know how life's gonna turn out for esperanza this is one of those days life can happen pretty fast if you don't <laughs> stop and take take a look around you just might miss it bow, bow. Bruce Willis and uh, intrepid reporter Sam Coleman have taken the news chopper and are flying over this plane. Arnie Pie up in the sky. Hey, let's go see what's happening over here. As inside, all of our evildoers, including James Evans and his team, are all celebrating the fact that they did evil successfully. Yeah. Then Bonnie Bedelia's plane radios the tower to say, hey, we're out of fuel. And in five minutes, we're coming down whether or not we have runway lights because otherwise we're just gonna crash yeah. and so everybody on the plane starts freaking out as they prepare for an emergency landing except of course for walter peck who is potentially dead in the bathroom with pants full of his own piss and who knows what else clearly semen <laughs> that's what they call a self blumpkin anyway bruce willis is like hey fly over this plane pal so he gets him to get over the wing of the plane what is his plan to just fall off the plane's taking off like what are you gonna do also how does him jumping on the wing of the plane with Esperance and the bad guy save his wife's life. I have no idea. Okay. At this point, he is just doing shit to do it. Like, he's no longer playing. I just want to kill some people. There's a lot of people in this tin can. I could kill them all. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I could really rack up the score here, pal. He jumps out of the plane, and his first order of business is to cram his coat into the flap as uh -huh. this plane goes down the longest runway in film history, only next to the one in Furious 5, or is it 6? Maybe 7. One of those with a, a runway. When he stuffs it into the ailerons on the wing, Esperanza says, Ay Dios mio, it's Bruce Willis. And I'm like, were you looking in the rearview mirror? Why would you say that? 
He's got one of those like concave mirrors on the windshield so he can kind of see. Mm -hmm. Action heroes in the mirror may be closer than they appear. <laughs> Maybe dumber than they appear. <laughs> and James Evans is like, I'll take care of it. And in a wonderful bit of ADR, as James Evans is climbing on the plane, you hear Esperanza say, don't shoot the wing. It is fully fueled. We need that for the climatic explosion for the movie's big ending. Don't do it too soon. We didn't want anything not to make sense. Yeah. Cut to a soundstage somewhere where they have a wing of an airplane set up yeah there's a whole fight situation this all ends with bruce willis knocking james evans off of the wing and into the engine in a splatter of blood damn 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 <laughs> florida evans drops the seven layer dip could a plane actually take off with the remains of a 70s sitcom star inside the engine if it didn't explode i assume that much like geese it just went through like shit through uh, said goose <laughs> at this time colonel naked bad guy he jumps out on the wing of the plane to take care of business all right mccain it's time for the main event and he hops out with a knife in his hand and these two wrestle and it ends with bruce willis taking a bite out of colonel naked bad guy's hand which was this a tip of the hat to mike tyson biting off holyfield's ear was that before or after this i think it just shows that he's a dirty fighter and always has been and always will be maybe it was an homage to de niro biting that lady's face in cape fear but that was after this i don't know it was an homage to somebody biting something but sure enough colonel naked bad guy does get the better of bruce willis and kicks him off the plane but chad before he falls he grabs the fuel dump handle so the plane is now leaking fuel out of the wing you say leaking i say spewing fuel <laughs> right it's just belching this stuff out of the wing <laughs> and so colonel naked bad guy clears the coat out of the flap or whatever we are clear to take off soldier yeah and so everybody's happy again they're taking off in the plane uh -huh. esperanza is pulling back on the stick getting ready for liftoff and then bruce willis seeing this trail of fuel mm -hmm. delivers the classic diehard line which comes out of nowhere and is apropos of nothing he, he says yippee ki -yay, motherfucker <laughs> And then opens his Zippo and tosses it at the fuel trail, which runs behind the plane, climbs into the air, and blows up the plane along with Esperanza, Colonel Naked Bad Guy, and all of the villains of the movie. I told you motherfuckers there was going to be a third plane. Pay up, you lousy sons of bitches. All right. Hey, hey, hey. Don't nobody's welching on a bed. Not on Christmas Eve, you no good motherfuckers. <laughs> and then Bruce Willis just laughs maniacally and starts screaming, Holly! Holly! And the plane, it turns out, uh, with his wife on board, sees the fire. Uh -huh, the charred, burning remains of terrorists. <laughs> yeah, and he's using these burning corpses as runway lights <laughs> to safely land. Fred Thompson sees this and says, get on the horn there and tell all those other planes they can do the same thing. Argyle is like, you don't have to tell them. They're telling each other. Yeah. We're totally useless in this movie. And the music behind this triumphant plane landing parade sounds like the police academy theme. It's this... Also, are all these planes going to be able to land and park? No. Quick enough to get the to allow the other planes? No. To land behind them? No, they're not. There are going to be more planes falling from the sky, killing more people on Christmas Eve. They just don't show that in the movie. It's nonsense. Bruce Willis staggers around. He's like, "Hey, pal, Bunny Padilla, my wife. Where are you?" And then she shows up out of nowhere and hears him screaming her name and she runs and they hug and embrace and bonnie bedelia to the best of her knowledge has no idea what her husband has been up to for the last two hours she also doesn't know why he's on the tarmac screaming her name she kind of at least you know uh, the movie is smart enough to allude to that because she says i heard there were terrorists and he's like yeah i heard that too we're terrorists <laughs> Why are you covered in blood? Oh God, what did you do? I really like the fact that she's like, I never thought I was going to see you again. In fact, in my head, I'd already started spending the life insurance money. So funny you say that. I was doing the same thing. There's a bit where Samantha Coleman and her reporting crew sees them and the camera points at them and Samantha Coleman covers the lens, even though she was the one who pointed it out, yeah. which is real mixed messages for a camera guy. She just doesn't want to go over 
and confront a woman whose husband she just offered up to fuck a few minutes ago that's weird yeah it's probably a little bit of just being uncomfortable we see walter peck laying on the ground in the snow i don't know what happened to him he asked for help from the drunk old lady who abuses animals for her own amusement although she says it's for educational purposes and walter peck says hey old lady help me up and then this drunk old lady calls him an asshole i think they just heave hoed him out the door <laughs> a couple of the the hostesses got a, an arm and a leg swung him a couple of times they were like ah the snow will break his fall then marvin our steam tunnel simpleton airport janitor he comes roaring up in a golf cart and he says mr policeman mr policeman i can give you a ride back to the airport and then dennis Franz shows up in a police car and he says hey mccain you son of a bitch hey you know what the sparking ticket that my brother gave you earlier i'm ripping it up watch me rip it up to hell with it it's christmas the bears the bulls i made seven thousand dollars when you blew up that fucking plane a minute ago you're the best bruce willis yeah that's why he tore up the ticket as he's flush with cash right now he's riding high on that endorphin rush then dean martin starts singing let it snow and everyone has a good laugh uh -huh. at the murderous adventures that they've all had on this truly unprecedented day of american aviation tragedy the end <laughs> yeah america's worst day of, of aviation so far up yeah until 9-11 this is such a disappointing movie not only is it just not as good as die hard it just kind of fundamentally misunderstands what makes die hard good like so many movies that do what they do well in the original and then you just see this string of shitty sequels i think that halloween is like that jaws is like that i think die hard is like that like you catch lightning in a bottle and you do something really well and trying to replicate it just it's not even just that it's bad it's just really awful yeah i mean there are good actors there are uh, like we were talking about william sadler gives a pretty good performance here fred thompson is kind of an old reliable he yeah. always lends some gravitas to the proceedings and whatnot yeah it's just disappointing because none of it matters it just gets so ridiculous and over the top that you just can't take any of it seriously anymore i think the only good diehard sequel is the jeremy irons one which is i mean a complete callback to the original but also the third one yeah that's the one where they have to pour water in buckets and figure out riddles and shit you like that one i think it's the best of the sequels i'm not saying it's a great movie i'm saying if you were going to do a diehard sequel that's at least an interesting take on it as opposed to doing a carbon copy of the first one it at least understands that john mcclain's appeal is that he's just kind of a dude and not a superhero i like that one where they drive a car into a helicopter and kevin smith shows up yeah that, i think that's the fourth one i never saw the last one whatever the a good day to die hard or uh live free and die hard one of them i saw the one with timothy oliphant and that's the one with kevin smith i saw that one that was where i was like i'm good i don't need to see any more of these <laughs> this ain't your daddy's die hard and sometimes that's not a good thing so that's it bo that is season 18's theme christmas time is here it's in the books we can close the vault but i feel like we might be forgetting something um wait bo we didn't rank our movies from top to bottom or bottom to top and we certainly can't forget that because if we did then we'd have to come back a week after we recorded the original episode and then seamlessly edit it back into this episode during the final edit, and we would never want to do that. <laughs> no, no. This is clearly something that happened organically, was in, in no way added later. It's, it's almost disingenuous to go back and edit something into a show that didn't exist there the first time. And we would never do that. We would never do anything so underhanded. Bo, how would you rank the movies from season 18, from top to bottom, bottom to top? Gentleman's choice, take it away. All right, let's 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 start at the bottom. Sure. Because I, eh, I think Pottersville is probably the worst. Not probably, it is. Well, I mean... <laughs> Because it's that or Ginger Dead Man. And it, so Ginger Dead Man would be like my number five on this list. But I give Ginger Dead Man at least a little bit of credit for being super cheap and also not very long. And Pottersville is a movie made by so-called filmmakers and is just a, a, a wasteland of entertainment. No arguments here. 
so I think that's the worst. I think Ginger Dead Man is above that. I think number four is Die Hard 2. Then I think I, the, my top three are movies that I kind of genuinely enjoyed on, on some level. I think my number three would be While You Were Sleeping, which isn't great, but it's kind of a charming enough romantic comedy and Sandra Bullock is, is really good in it and uh, so forth. So I think that movie's kind of fine. Uh, my number two would be Invasion USA because it is like Chuck Norris is terrible, but the, the stunts and explosions and the speed that that movie kind of hurdles to its ending. Uh, I, th I think all of that works real well. Uh, I think that's quite good. And then Batman Returns would be my best because I it's an interesting movie. Like it, it's like psychologically kind of dense and it's got great performances from all of the leads. And it's kind of a mess of a movie, but that also makes it kind of interesting to me because it, it it's it's totally two movies happening at the same time where it, it's Tim burton making a movie about all these psychologically damaged people and then the studio making him also make a superhero movie and those two things sit alongside each other really uncomfortably but i also find that interesting so that's why it's the best for me it's just I, like i could go back and watch batman returns right now and get so what about you that's my my six all wrapped up in a saucy little burrito i'm so surprised that batman returns eked out Invasion USA. I'm surprised, but not surprised. And I got to tell you, my ranking is pretty close to yours. Pottersville is in the dumpster. Ginger Dead Man is just ahead of it, only because going into Ginger Dead Man, you know what you're going to get. You know it's going to be garbage, and it delivers garbage. Pottersville, you don't know what you're going to get, and they give you a bunch of good actors and Bigfoot and furry sex, which nobody wants to see that. Well, maybe some people, but I'm not one of those people. Um, Die Hard, right in the middle. Above that, I put Batman Returns. And both for the first time ever, I got a tie between Invasion USA and While You Were Sleeping as my number one spot. And I say that because depending upon who you're watching these movies with dictates which one you should watch first. So if you're just hanging out with the fellas or a bunch of idiots, it's Invasion USA. If you need a good date night movie, then you go While You Were Sleeping. They are both equally charming in their equally disturbing way. I'll tell you, Bo, I love 90s era action movies that are ripoffs of the original Die Hard, which gives me an idea, Bo, a wonderful, awful idea. What if next season we did six movies that were all ripoffs of Die Hard, just like this movie? Perhaps we could call that season Die Hard Ons? <laughs> I like where your head's at, and I'll do you one better. How about to kick things off? Yes. We don't do the ripoff of Die Hard. We do the sequel to the ripoff of Die Hard. That's also a ripoff of Die Hard. Go on. It's called Under Siege 2 Dark Territory, and it welcomes to the proceedings one Steven Seagal. Long overdue, Mr. Seagal. Yeah, you, you got Katherine Heigl bouncing around in that movie. You got Everett McGill, who we haven't seen since Silver Bullet. Also, a healthy dose of Eric Bogosian, made famous in Oliver Stone's talk radio and pretty much nothing else. <laughs> Wait, he was on a Law and Order. Oh, I'm sure he was. Yeah. CB something. Law and Order CBS. Yeah. They'll solve your crime and <laughs> fill your prescription and get your pictures done in an hour. Right. Get your passport photo and also solve a crime. <laughs> yeah. So Under Siege 2 Dark Territory. Uh, don't forget the, the subtitle. Sure. Is a movie in which you could easily sum it up as it is Die Hard on a Train with Steven Seagal. That sounds like something that we should absolutely be doing in two weeks from today. Bo, any final thoughts that you have on Die Hard 2? Die Harder? Uh, only that it is misbegotten. It, it's a movie that asks the question... Why on earth would anyone think Rennie Harlan should be in charge of a Die Hard movie? Didn't he do Cliffhanger? So yeah, it may be sooner rather than later that <laughs> Rennie Harlan makes yet another appearance on Pick 6 Movies. We might, might do just back-to-back -back seasons. So that is Die Hard 2. As always, you can like, rate, review. You can email us at pick6movies at gmail.com. We know that this is coming out right at the start of the new year been a rough two years we appreciate everybody that listens and shares and um, we have a blast doing the show and we're looking forward to bringing you a brand new season as we move into hopefully what will be a much more bright 2022